Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA Live 197. <laughs> Hopefully everybody had a good week. Uh, and uh, let's see. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Friday, right? It feels like it went by fast. Couple things, uh, just if you're new to the show and you want to try to get my attention or you're talking to me, uh, either asking a question or trying to get a subject going, please put the question mark at the beginning of the statement. That way I know it's directed at me. Um, also, if uh, you're watching the rebroadcast, uh, we timestamp or I timestamp all the subjects and questions so that you can go right to them. So uh, if there's anything interesting to you, you can go right to that. And of course, if you just want to listen to it, you can listen to it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, iHeartRadio. Wherever you find fine podcasts, um, <laughs> so couple couple of things. Uh, I, oh, I should uh, get into this right away. Uh, as you guys know, some of you guys really come early and jump on early and ask questions and stuff. And um, and I pinned a couple of those questions, or I, I copied them. And and uh, the first one was, uh, what was it? <laughs> it was. Uh, it looks like it was Big Bass Brian. And uh, that's a double whammy today. Here's why. Uh, it, first, I'm going to read his question. But secondly, uh, second of all, he won something. So if you remember about a month ago, uh, or no, maybe about three weeks ago, I, uh, I mentioned the guys, or, or I should say the owner of Tune Ninja came out and uh, sent me some Tuner Ninja uh, uh, magnetic headstock tuners. What they do is they, here, let me show you. Look at this. We got the, the B cam. Uh, basically, it uses a magnet. And it sticks on the headstock. There you go. And that's how it works. And again, it just uses a magnet so I, to do that. Okay. And then that way you can tune your guitar. Right. So get back to me. Uh, and of course, uh, it, some of you guys uh, got, gave me feedback. It works for some of you, not for all of you on the whole hanging it on a, on a tune on a headstock hanger like this, as you can see, that's why I did this. So you can see it's, it is working for me. On most of my headstocks. So, uh, he he, you guys supported him so much. He sold so many of those things, uh, and he said, "Could we give another one away?" And believe it or not, this is where he gets another kudo for me. He, uh, I said, "Sure, let's do it. We're gonna do it like the following week because you guys did such a, you know, you guys went crazy." He said, "Can we wait until I get feedback on them?" And so he received a lot of feedback from you guys, and he said. Uh, like 99% of it was positive. 1% of it was, he said negative. Uh, it was like four star review versus a five star. So it wasn't negative. And uh, he said, let's give some away. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to be giving one of these away. In fact, I just gave it to Big Bass Brian, which is kind of scaring me because I'm thinking Big Bass Brian might only have bases. I don't know if this works on a bass. Big, big, big Bass Brian, you're going to find out. So uh, he won one. So there you go. Big base, Brian, please send me an email to ask, know your gear at, uh, gmail.com and, uh, just put in the subject, uh, tuner ninja that you won one. And, uh, I will make sure I ship one out. When I say me, I mean my wife and I'm going to mean fast. I mean, not <laughs> it'll, it'll get out. It takes about a week. Uh, I think Steve is the one who won the last one. I think it took about a week and a half for him to get his. Uh, so anyways, also I put a link in the description in case you guys are interested in buying one and supporting this company. Uh, I want to thank him again for, for doing this. And, and, and like I said, and because of doing this, by the way, uh, a couple other small companies have reached out to me and they're sending me some product and have sent me a couple pieces of product and we'll do this. I'll just do giveaways. Uh, so we'll do a fun. We'll be fun. Maybe it'll be fun. I don't know. You guys let me know. <laughs> it sounds fun. Um, except for when you guys live outside the country and you have to go and do customs paperwork. All right. But Big Bass Brian, what was his question? What was uh, what was on his mind today? It was, I have trouble deciding these things. <laughs> okay. Best all around sub $800 guitar for home studio recording. Um, you know, again, this is always an opinion based system. You know, I can't unfortunately tell you for sure what's the best $800 guitar ish. Um, I, I would say for recording for me, it's going to be some kind of, you got your guest it, everyone strat style guitar. Actually, not really. If you're doing recording, you just want to nail as many things as possible. So it depends if you're recording a style of music. Well, then you have to find your voice. You have to find that guitar that is your sound and, and helps you with your fingers and your, and your playing style, you know, kind of, kind of get that out there out to the world. However, if you're recording just to get like a, you know, recording different sounds and songs and you want a versatile guitar, versatile guitar, I would go with anything that has uh, a humbucker and single coils. So some kind of blend like an HSS strap 
or some kind of guitar that has coil splitting ability. So you could do that. Uh, and to be honest with you, that's what's great. Your price range, 800 bucks, you're, you're in there, buddy. You got everything. Uh, don't forget used, first of all. And to be honest with you, for $800, you could get two sweet ass $400 guitars and have every kind of sound. But think of this, for 800 bucks, you could walk into any mom and pop music store, basically, and buy some kind of Strat style guitar and and Les Paul style guitar and nail the majority of the sounds if that's what you're going for. And that's what I would do. I would think about that if you're, especially if you're going for that kind of sound. So, um, and also you could always just, like I said, buy one nice guitar that does it all. Schecter's do that. Fenders do that. Epiphone's do that. There's a lot of brands out there. It's a, uh, I wish I could be like, this is the one, but, um, no, it's, it's, you live in the best time to, to have an $800 guitar budget. It's, uh, the world is your oyster, as they would say. An $800 budget is a very, I mean, you can have everything. <laughs> There's no, you know, it's where it gets, here's where the better question is for me, is where does the number get tricky for me to answer that question? And, I, and I, I've decided it's 200 to $250. At $300, if somebody says, hey, what can I get good for $300? I'm like, oh, you could buy a used Godin for 300 bucks. You can buy a used uh, PV guitar for 300 bucks. You could buy a smoking used Epiphone for 300 bucks. You could buy a great Fender or Squire Strat for 300 bucks. I mean, 300 bucks, you, you really should not have a problem finding a good $300 guitar. Uh, I don't. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's in, I'm not even looking that hard. But 200 and 250 bucks, it gets a little trickier. Uh, you got to start looking for those cool brands that are trying to entice you with those pricing, whether that be like Harley Benton or or the Slick Guys or the uh, Xavier or, or uh, Firefly or just finding those sweet used deals. But they get a little tricky. It's funny, funny thing. And here's why. There's actually a, a reasoning. It's used guitars get tricky in that price range because it makes it hard for people to want to sell them. Um, you know, when you sell a guitar for $150, $200, you, we all know the game. The shipping on that gets ridiculous. The fees, the time, you know, by the time you reverb a $200 guitar, and that's if you got the full shipping price out of it. So it's not 250 bucks or $200 guitar because at least $50 in shipping. By the time you sell a $200 guitar, in other words, $200 plus you're getting the 50 for shipping, uh, you're probably going to net about $180 of that. And then to find a box, box it, ship it out, it gets a little troublesome for a lot of people. So you notice that there's not th that many in that plethora of, uh, of the market. Plus that's the stuff that gets gobbled up fast because everybody's looking for the cheapest guitar. So, um, to answer that question, I think 800 bucks, uh, as much as I'd like to tell you, you know, buy one of these, uh, I think, uh, no man, uh, don't worry about it. You got it. Go out there, find something that you love in that price point and get it. Uh, but, <laughs> Uh, for those of you in looking in other price ranges, I think, uh, I think that if you have 200 bucks, my suggestion would be not to not, you know, you don't have to spend more, but I'm telling you, if you could get three, you don't have to make any concessions anymore. Like I said, and if I had 300 bucks, what would I get? Uh, well, when I did the video years ago, uh, at the Sam Ash, you know, what guitar would I buy for $500? And I bought that Gibson Les Paul tribute. Um, essentially it was in my DNA to buy the deal. You know what I mean? To find a, a really good deal. And and for a lot of reasons. And that's why that video, hopefully it did well, it did well. But I think it did well because it wasn't it, for most people. Wow, he got a deal on a Les Paul. I think people, I think that the core of you guys, the core of us, you recognize kindred spirits, <laughs> as you will. It's not hard. In fact, I hope that's something that was conveyed in that video. You know, I threw down my 500 bucks. That was my cash. And I had no idea I would get a million views on that video, by the way. And so, you know, because Led Zeppelin's played it through the PA, the entire video, it could get demonetized at any time. I'm surprised it hasn't been now. <laughs> but I think the only reason it hasn't been is because it, because I'm so chatty, I never shut up long enough for, I think, the, the bots or people to hear the music and just by itself because I'm talking over the music. But um, but anyways, like I said, it, you know, that video, it paid me back, which is great. But I didn't know that going in. I, I Going in, I thought maybe if I made 30. Actually, I'll tell you, this is a, a funny story about that video and how I tell you how, how YouTube grows. When I made the what guitar would I buy for $500 video? I, I took my buddy Joe and uh, Ralph with me to help me record because I didn't want to lock down Sam Ash too long because they were kind enough to let us run through there. I didn't want to disrupt their business any more than I had to. And uh, so I had them help me and I uh, took them to Chili's because I'm a classy kind of guy like that. And 
<laughs> and uh, after when we went to Chili's, I remember that day. I'll never forget this. I remember when I, I, I took the bill. I said, hey, no, no. I grabbed the bill and I said, I'll pay. And I paid for helping me. Kind of like when you buy pizza for your friends to help you move. And I remember thinking, man, I hope this video makes enough just to pay for lunch. That would be awesome. <laughs> and uh, so not only did uh, the video make enough to pay me back for that, um, the guitar held value. In fact, I, I ended up selling that guitar two years later for a, a hefty profit. I think I got seven for it. At that time, it was worth eight or nine. Uh, but I think I, you know, I sweethearted somebody at seven. I, I didn't want to be greedy. I figured I made my 500 bucks back and uh, and uh, and then a little sum, a little cheddar for the for the pocket, maybe to add to another guitar. So, um, so there you go. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not old. I'm vintage says, cause it's on the same subject. If you're not, if you're going to Chili's, you gotta have the queso. Yes. You know, for me, Chili's the fajitas. It's that something about bringing it on a steaming, hot, psychotic plate classes it up a little bit. Somebody said the Chili's ribs, but <laughs> yeah, the baby back ribs. Um, I don't know what it is. I can't, I, I must be missing something uh, with the Chili's ribs. I never tried them. I think it's because, um, uh, and Arizona is not a barbecue state or town, or I, you know, because I live in Phoenix. It's not a barbecue place. Like I've been to like Tennessee, you know, you can go around the country to great barbecue places. But I think maybe because we're Southwestern, we do have some great barbecue places. So they're not up there in the same level. I would never put our barbecue places against any legitimate places I've been to out there and around the country. But there's a lot of little mom and pops when I'm trying to say barbecue places. I try to hit those uh, more so because they're they're good and, you know, they're mom and pops. But the Chili's, um, you know, what? actually, and then uh, I mean, I'm thinking the wrong restaurant. I was going to think of, there was a dessert I thought I liked, but it's not a Chili's. Um, <laughs> okay. And because this is just random, uh, I'm going to say Marizo. Marizo, I hope I got it. You know, I'm just phonetically grabbing letters in my head. Uh, he says, can you explain to my wife <laughs> what gas is? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and, I'll, and I won't go for the joke because uh, I think it's a legitimate thing. Because I'm sure uh, if, you're, if your poor wife is sitting next to you watching a podcast stream like this, uh, God bless her, one. <laughs> And two, um, cause she just pretty much doubled my female demographic. So thank you for that. But also, um, I'm just kidding. I don't want to, I don't want to ever put off. There's actually, I have a pretty strong female demographic. It's 3%, almost four. Sounds like not a big deal. Actually a big deal. Almost 4%. So pretty impressive actually for a gear channel to, uh, so, uh, the ladies, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so to your wife, what gas is? Yes. It's a compulsion to always need more crap. That's the slang way, and it's probably not helping your your cause. Uh, so what it is, is it's your passion is in trying, experiencing, and owning new things. That's what gear acquisition syndrome is. It's not the pursuit of different tones or music, because that's part of our music side of our brain. you know. And I've said this many times, and, and it hopefully it makes sense. Look, I love making music. I love practicing. I love learning songs. I like playing music with other people. And I have no delusions in myself to think that this owning this wall of stuff has anything to do with that <laughs> it doesn't but just because i like playing music doesn't mean buying guitars is somehow not a valuable part of my time this is something to do with my time you know sometimes you know i can play music and that's great and sometimes i i do that stuff but i i in my life i i've literally now like i said 16 years is that right yeah, 16, going on 17 years now. 16 years I've been in the music business. But by that meaning, I mean making my entire living uh, off guitars, some kind of guitar-related thing. So uh, that's how I've supported my family and done stuff. So, but my, but that being said, my hobby is also guitars. So um, I don't have other hobbies. I don't have other interests. I'm not into jet skiing or paragliding or. <laughs> collecting, uh, uh, you know, uh, action figures or whatever people do. I don't play video games. I don't even play video games. Nothing, nothing, just this all the time. So, uh, to your wife, that was the longest, most boring answer, but I hope she hung in to the fact that gear acquisition syndrome is just this compulsion to want to collect or try. It's really about trying. And I think that's what really it gets down to. It's about trying new guitars. That's one thing I love about the channel. It's what I loved about, somebody asked me uh, months ago and I couldn't really 
qualify or quantify the answer. Somebody asked me what I miss about the store. Nothing. And the reason I, and I feel bad when I said that, I go, why is there nothing I'm missing from the store? And I realized it's because I'm here on YouTube doing the same thing. What I did in my store, and a lot of the viewers are my old customers, they they can validate this. <laughs> You'd come in the store and I, I would be trying gear out. That's what I would do. I would be constantly showing people new stuff like I'm doing on my channel. To me, this is the fun. Trying a new guitar, hearing a new tone, trying a new pickup, trying a new pedal. There's never enough. I don't need to own it all. In fact, <laughs> I, I always have too much. And, and it's just because, like I said, for me, my justification is I have a YouTube channel. So I need some of the stuff for work. You know what I mean? For the, for the, for the job. But some of it's just, you know, I want it. I work hard, bought it. And I don't feel guilty about it. Not not really. As long as the bills are paid. Uh, <laughs> at least that's what my wife says. He says, okay, I can buy a new Les Paul. She's typing under... <laughs> she's typing under one green bur burst under the... Uh, wait. She's typing under one green burst on the wall. And I'm typing under an Alpine white one. <laughs> you know, that's a beautiful thing. I, uh, I decided to marry my wife... Because uh, I think I told you guys this when I got when I was in the army, I, I basically sold all my stuff and, uh, you know, and I joined. I, I literally like was broke as hell. So uh, I kept a base. And when I came back, because, you know, uh, that's what you do eventually over time. You come back. We weren't married. So she didn't travel with me. She didn't go with me anywhere. Um, when I came back and uh, time to move back into civilian life, the first thing my girlfriend, which is now my wife, did was she took me to the local music store because she knew I was still broke, man. You're in the army, you're still broke. You're making that, you're making a little bit of money. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, you could pay. I paid the bills. That's it. You pay the bills and nothing left over. She took me down and bought me a used RG, I think 450 Ibanez in black. And... Uh, She's like, it's not right. You don't have a guitar. You need a guitar. And she took me down and bought me a guitar. And uh, and uh, I decided right then uh, she will never say no to anything I ask to buy when I buy guitars. And so, therefore, I'm smart. I should marry her. I, actually, it's because I love her. But there was a little bit of that logic going in there, too. It was like, okay, I love her like a lot this much. And then I was also like, this is a smart deal. Like, she, How could she shun me for buying guitars in the future when she herself did it? That would be my logic for you guys out there. <laughs> uh, and plus, I always tell everybody I know, uh, if uh, if, uh, if your uh, boyfriend or girlfriend buys you a guitar, marry them. Because uh, I know sometimes I get a little odd tangent on these shows, but let me tell you a secret I learned from selling thousands of guitars, no exaggerations, to all kinds of people uh, in in a face-to-face -face business. And that's really the important part of the thing. When I say I sell stuff to, get to people, it's not about the dollar transaction. Transaction. It's about the handshakes. You know, I've, I've sold thousands of people talking one-on-one, -on -one, learning them, talking to them, like you would if you work at a guitar center or at the, you know, at the uh, JCPenney's, uh, I, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And here's what I learned. I learned a little, a little secret that you may not know. You, and I mean you being, uh, you know, the husband or the wife, doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. No, I'm trying to say this perfectly, so please bear with me. When it comes to getting permission from your spouse, you can always get whatever you did before you were married. So what I mean by that is, if you ride a motorcycle before you were married, you'll ride a motorcycle when you're married. If you buy guitars before you're married, you can buy guitars afterwards. If you go camping with your friends uh, and it's a thing and you leave them and you can go do that. I've learned this. What I've learned is it's impossible, not, not totally impossible, very hard to add those things into your life if you didn't do them before the marriage. It's almost like a deal breaker. So if you ever, like in my case, this is my wall of guitars. My wife is amazing. You should see what happens if I ask my wife for a motorcycle. <laughs> it's no the answer is no it's not even like a oh we should talk about that it's just no that's not gonna happen no um and it's why it's because of i don't even have to to ask anyone i i found the answer myself uh i did it before i was married to her and so i can continue to do it it's almost like it's just it's built-in permission so i tell you that for those of you young uh people or people about to get remarried again think about that so if you're thinking of any hobbies or anything you might want to do in the future, just kind of pretend you're doing it now a little bit. Get that in, get that already built-in permission going. I, and I learned that from at the shop 
you know, a guy would come in, usually a guy, but just to be fair, it was a guy, <laughs> come in and he'd be like, honey, I'm, I'm at the store buying a guitar. And the guy could make 600000 a year and it was a $200 guitar. And she was like, no. <laughs> right? But that same guy could go buy a Porsche. <laughs> and I was like, so it's not a money thing. Everybody always thinks it's a money thing. Sometimes it is. Money is a physical issue, mental, physical issue, both. But I watched it so many times happen like that. And I thought to myself, why can that guy go buy a Porsche, but he can't buy a Squire? It makes no sense. Ah, because he did, he, that was the thing he did before they're married. And now he can't add new things. So, or it's very hard to do those things. All right. We should probably get focused again. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Marizo, I hope I hope again I'm saying the name Marizio. Maybe that's it. Uh, anyways, it says uh, my wife just said no to the motorcycle, but I just chew, uh, but I just chose a bourbon burst. Oh, that's a great. I had a bourbon burst, Les Paul. Um, I have no idea to this day. There's so many things I can explain uh, when it comes to the buying and selling of things I've decided in the past. There is a, I had a bourbon burst Les Paul that was super light. That was great. That was amazing. And to this day, I cannot figure out why the heck I sold it. I can't remember. I just remember one day going, I'm going to sell this. And I sold it and I've never been able to find anything like it again. And, um, I, and like I said, everything else, I could come up with a reason. Like I wanted to buy something else and, you know, maybe the taxes were due something, right? Something happens and you're like, Oh, got to thin the herd or change things up. And I, that, I, that guitar, I just remember loving it. And then one day going, yeah, I'll sell it. <laughs> and I sold it. So don't sell your bourbon burst. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let me, uh, let me get to the next question. The next question is from, who is it from? And I know I got some uh, super chat stuff. Don't worry. I'm not going to miss you guys. Um, next one is uh, from Christopher who says, any thoughts on the Schecter Tempest and, and, or the Squire classic vibe Starcaster? Love the channel. Keep up this very informative channel. All the best from Regina, uh, Saskatoon. I, I, you know what? I feel horrible. It's Canada. Saskatchewan. Is this Saskatchewan, right? Okay. So here's the deal. I have a friend from in Canada who's from Saskatchewan. And if I want to trigger him, I say Saskatoon. And so, you know, I'm not mispronouncing it. Well, I am, but it's from the Adam Sandler movie, Grown Ups. <laughs> Right. When the guy said that weird like that. So anyway, Saskatchewan, I'm sorry. So uh, to answer your question, check your Tempest or the Squire Classic Vibe Starcaster. So the Starcaster he's talking about is a semi hollow body uh, guitar that's kind of like an offset -y ES-330 vibe, vibe. So they're 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 different but same. Uh, me, if it was me going, I'd go for the Tempest. I'm a, I'm a, a Schecter fan. Plus I'm a Tempest fan. If you guys don't know, the Tempest is, I think is a cool idea. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a PRS. It's kind of like a double cut a Gibson. It's got its own flair. It's a, everything I love about an SG, everything I love a Les, about a Les Paul. Great guitar. Fun little fact about it is uh, it's not named after Mike Tepensta from uh, Power Man 5000, which I think is Rob Zombie's brother. I feel like a DJ. <laughs> he wrote his first song when he was... Anyways, uh, so yeah, Mike Tepensta, uh, I think that was going to be, either was for a short period of time or was going to be a signature model. Either didn't work out or then eventually stopped and now they call it the Tempest. So there you go. Cool guitar. Uh, definitely, and, and in my opinion, one of the things that Schechter does, it's just got its own kind of flair and vibe to it. So if I was going to go for one, I'd go for the, 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 the Tempest. Um, me personally, because that's one I would actually buy. Okay. Uh, and then uh, just because on top topic, Serang says, look into the Ibanez AR250H also, or he says two, but also, of course. So check that out. Uh, Don says, Rob Zombie's brother is Spider. So, okay, maybe I'm wrong. I, I just, I remember there's some kind of connection. Again, I'm just kind of doing off memory. I just know, just remember Mike Depensta from Power Man 5000. That was going to be a signature guitar. So, um, uh, it was one of those, uh, it was one of those, um, the guys at Schechter told me that's something. <laughs> Cause I think I asked, why is it called it? You know, where do you come up with the names? And then they, they rattled off some stuff like that. Okay. So let me, let me grab some super chat since I have a couple things penned and let me bump around and see what's going on. Uh, Matthew says when working on stainless steel frets, do I need 
special cutters, files, etc., or can I use the ones I use on standard frets? Yeah, you're you're generally speaking, uh, you know, files. You want to if you're going to do stainless steel, you want to use like diamond files or the best kind of files, I should say, best quality ones. Um, However, no, I, I don't use any special tools. How about that? And I'm pretty much standard for what I've seen out there and how everybody's working on stainless steel uh, uh, frets. Um, the stainless steel frets are harder, therefore they take a little bit more work and they wear your tools down a little faster. It depends. You gotta understand. I hear that term all the time. I, I decided, like I said, I decided uh, just to stop offering st uh, standard refret jobs. And, and now I just do only stainless steel. Now, of course, if somebody special requests it, but what I did is to do this, to facilitate to facilitate this, I just started charging the same for stainless steel as, as a standard nickel refret. And um, everybody took it, of course. And the reason I did it was one, it's just easier to buy one kind of, or one kinds of fret wire, which is stainless steel, stainless steel and all the gauges. But also I was curious. I wanted to hear, or not hear, I wanted to see like I do in a lot of my videos, I want to see if every, what everybody says is true. And here's what I can tell you. Yeah, I did notice that I had to either replace a file or uh, sharpen some tools, especially your cutters. <laughs> you, you, you'll feel it. You'll feel it on your, on your snips, on your cutters when you're doing stainless steel. You'll feel how hard they are because you, you know, you usually cut through them like they're butter. And then these were like, oh, I was like, oh my goodness. Okay, there's some reality to this. Um, but what I can tell you is, uh, I probably do one refret a month and I'm rounding up by one. Cause I think last year when I look at my dockets or my paperwork, my, my receipts, I did 11 refrets last year, not including any I did for myself, which I did too. Um, so, and I noticed no issue. Like I didn't have to buy anything any faster. So a lot of times when people complain about them wearing down their tools, I think they're talking about more volume than that. So I tell people if you're doing one or two refrets for yourself, I don't even think I'd worry. I, I would just do the stand still. It's more work. It's, it is, you're just, you feel like you're working on them longer <laughs> and they, uh, if you guys see in videos and I, uh, every, let's see if I can, maybe I can do it this way. Let's see. Can you see my hands? <laughs> like my hands are chewed. Uh, yeah, you can see it there. I'm sorry if this is not the best focused thing, but you can see I have, my hands are chewed and it's from working on frets all day. My hands always look like in every video I see my hands when I'm playing and stuff. And you can always see the just the chunks taken out of my hands. And it's always from fret wire. That seems to always uh, either it's fret sprout guitars catching my hands or just working the stainless steel. You, you'll work. You'll you'll thrash your hands a little bit more. But hey, you know, I don't know. It's not a big deal. I used to, you know, have to take a tanker bar and change five hundred dollar five hundred pound tires. So it's not hard. <laughs> Let's just say I'd rather do this. Um Okay, so uh, let's get back to oh, another one. Next question. What's the next one? Next one's from Fred. Says, hey, Phil, did uh, you ever try the Digitech drop pedal? Uh, is it is it that good? Question mark. Love the channel. Thanks uh, to be there with you. Honestly, uh, it says, um, you know, it's it's a help. So he, thank you. He's from Quebec, Canada. I, I, he's just being flattering. So, uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, so yeah, I did, and um, I like the G Digitech Drop Tune. So uh, in the in the Drop Tune pedals that are out there, there are a couple players that I like. Obviously, I like uh, the the Pitchfork by Electro Harmonics. I like that one a lot. I, I that's the one I still think I still currently own. The Digitech Drop Tune is great. Uh, I had the Morpheus. Uh, that's an off-brand one, but it's a really good one. Uh, it's a little big. That was the only issue I had with it. Size-wise, was taking up two pedal slots and for something like that. And um, the one I use now is the one by uh, Electro Harmonics. Um, and for no reason other than I got my own tone print. <laughs> So that's that's what ended up happening. <laughs> I just got a tone. I have my own like Phil McKnight tone print. If you guys remember when I did the one of the the, the YouTuber events, they they let a bunch of YouTubers uh, pretend they're rock stars. I was one of those. I got to pretend. It was it was a very good experience. I can tell you like if you, I've never had the experience. Of, like some of you guys may have had this experience maybe through a work or something like that, um, where you get to have like a red carpet kind of vibe, you know, and you go, oh, this is what, what famous people feel like. Or you go to a restaurant, you know, some kind of thing. Everybody's kind of had that experience a little bit, you know? Uh, and that was my, definitely like my, this is what famous rock stars must feel like when somebody like cares about what they say and, you know, and they were tweaking all my stuff and doing all my stuff and made the tone print. So uh, so that's why I use that one. But yeah, no, the drop the drop pedal is a fantastic pedal. 
I got no complaints. Uh, some I, some people claim there's a slight latency to it, but I mean, you're never going to notice. It's not, it's not worth wor worrying about. Uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Uh, let me read a question and drink water. Like I say, I feel like every week I'm in Arizona. Uh, something that's happening right now is, uh, this is Arizona's like our winter's over. I don't even understand. So you guys any more winter fall. I've lived in Arizona so long now. I don't even know what that, all that is. There's to me in Arizona, there's hot and then not hot. That's it. That's all we have. Okay. No complaints, but that's, so the reason I tell you this is things are blooming right now because it's warming up. My sinuses are going crazy. I took Claritin, but I didn't think that I need to drink more water. So I feel a little dehydrated. So I'm just telling you guys that if you see me drinking water, I, I had it all under control last like five episodes, not having to drink so much water by drinking earlier, but I didn't think about the Claritin dries you out. Okay. D uh, JSL project says, Hey Phil. So I got a PV5152 getting a microphonic ping from the preamp tube and replaced it. The new tube barely has any glow to it. And, uh, the amp sounds the same as before, which is kind of fizzy. Thanks for everything. So, you know, first of all, yeah, there could be an underlying problem in the amp besides the preamp tube. However, you have to understand preamp tubes are just tubes in general are just problematic things. So your first, your first best assessment should always be. There's a problem with the tube, even if it's a brand new tube, just assume the new tubes crap too. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a weird feeling. It's like not, you would never expect to buy a battery, put it in and find the battery almost dead. <laughs> okay. But tubes are like that. And, uh, and if you want my opinion, if it's a groove tube, that's probably already the problem already. Cause groove tubes are like the worst. And that's just from my experience. Some people might like them. I don't like them and I hate it. Cause I like Fender amps and they're in like every Fender amp cause they own them. I like JJ's. I am not a tube connoisseur. I'm not going to give you advice about Mullards or old stock GEs, all that stuff. I literally do none of that stuff. I, I literally just use JJ's. I have good luck with them. They're cheap. I'm happy. <laughs> Got no complaints. If anyone wants to put in their two cents of why their suggestions better, they're probably validated. Cause if you're a tube junkie, you're way ahead of it than me. It's not my, not my thing to, to geek out on. Um, so my, JSL, I would definitely, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a groove tube, it's probably that problem. Uh, but if it's any tube, you could have that problem. Uh, it's pre tube. It's cheap. Try another one. You don't even have to, um, Buy another tube if you don't have one. Just swap two tubes and see if the problem follows. That's best, you know, kind of Occam's razor kind of logic, right? Swap the tube. If it's still uh, glowing low and you're still having the issue, uh, then you know it's probably not the tube. If the, the tube moves and now the problem moves with it, then you know. Uh, so I would do that. Don't be afraid to change out the print tubes or move them around. Just keep track of them. It's not a, And uh, the low glowing thing is not a big deal. Believe it or not, tubes, some, even preamp tubes, some are just brighter than others for, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, usually if it's not as bright, it's not, I don't want to say it's not burning as hot. That's probably going to trigger some tube guy who knows what he's talking about. But but that's just the best way I have to explain it. And you will see issues with that. But yeah, uh, just as, I would just assume that new tube's bad too and then swap into the tube. And then if that doesn't work, now you have a really good working problem, which is, Hey, two different, the odds of you getting two bad tubes in a row, uh, from two different brands, definitely pick a different brand, <laughs> you know what I mean? Second time, or at least get a different batch or something like that. It's not likely, but it's possible. It's just not likely. Uh, Benzenite products. Hey, Benzenite, how's it going? Like I said, Benzenite makes, uh, uh he makes, uh, Benzenite, uh, which is the metal, uh, products, which are like, uh, bridges and, uh, and uh, string trees, not string trees, uh, saddles and stuff. He says, Hey, Phil, have any thoughts on the new uh, Fender 68 Vibro Champ? I have not. I saw Fender reissued two 68 new amps this year, the Vibro Champ, and I forgot what the other one was. It's a 40 watt amp. I literally paid attention enough to remember there was two amps and nothing more. Um, I, you know, it's one of those things I already know I'm not going to be able to try one. There's uh, amps are pretty much done when it comes to trying amps anymore. Um, where I live, Guitar Center stocks like four practice amps and then whatever comes in used at all the GCs. Um, and it's it's really consistent right now with walking to stores and just not seeing any amps to try out. So when it comes to new amps, I just assume I'm not going to try them unless I get to buy them uh, or a company sends them to me. And, and um, so, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I, I love to try them. 
I, you know, like I said, as you know, I'm a huge 68 Princeton fan. I have two of them. <laughs> so, uh, I love the series. I love the amps, but like I said, I just don't know how I would get my hands on them right now, especially, uh, maybe eventually, but not right now. Uh, my focuses are on the, um, the guitars right now, getting guitars on the channel, which I've successfully done. In fact, I've been working nonstop. Hope you guys are liking the, so hopefully you guys like the new videos. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce this name. <laughs> so I'm going to say Z. <laughs> Z says, hi from Croatia. It's 11 p.m. So today I am, wait, so today and it's 11 p.m. So today and tomorrow show having issues with bass intonation. Okay. Zero and 12 frets are okay. So, okay. The first 12 frets are okay. Fifth fret is sharp. Next seems straight. Um, E yes, but okay. So here's where we're having problems. So let's just talk about this. Makes it easy. So your intonation issues. Um, I understand what you're saying about basically open fret to the 12th fret are okay, but your fifth, fifth fret is sharp. First of all, uh, I kind of want to know, you know, because I don't know what strings. If it, all strings are just one, so it could be one string could be an issue. Um, I have seen that before where one, like you say, where the intonation feels like it's all right. And then all of a sudden there's just a spot that's just out. And, um, how we fixed it was we just kept, re you know, making sure the neck was s straight. We make sure we just did redid the setup over and over again and we fixed it. Um, what I remember though was in that particular case, which may not pertain to you, but again, I can only tell you from the things I've kind of drawn on is, um, in that particular case, the, that one fret was hot. The fret, the sixth fret was high. And because it was high, what was happening was the player was pushing uh, harder. And so was I, when I was doing it, and that was what was pushing it sharp, You're pushing a little hard. That is, um, and I want to point out in our case, it was hard to hear it, but the, t the tuner was detecting the issue. Sometimes that becomes a problem. Sometimes, you know, we have these really amazing strobe tuners and great tuners now. And, um, and it gets a little tricky because sometimes the tuners are telling you things that you can kind of hear. It's kind of like, and it's not a placebo. You can hear the problem because the tuner made you aware that it exists, right? The tuner's telling you it's slightly sharp. And now your ear, of course, with that information in your head, detects this sharp tone. But given to your own ears, you wouldn't have detected it. And so um, that I think that was kind of the case. But that was years ago. So I would check the frets. That's where I would start there. If you have one, because again, we're trying to isolate to one problem. If you have one fret, <laughs> even if it's all four strings or six strings, because I think it's a, yeah, it's a bass, so four strings. Um, even if it's all four strings on one fret, we're just going to have to assume that the problem is in the frets because that's the uniqueness to it. That's the unique issue, uh, situation. Uh, Josh Smith says, Phil, I too was in the ordinance core. Hey, that's awesome. Who uh, says, have you ever heard our official song? Maybe yeah, he says maybe at AIT graduation or something similar. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, I I don't remember. My AIT was in uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, and um, it was cold as hell. <laughs> um, so I all I remember was thinking is, man, I can't wait for this to be done so I can go back in the barracks where it's not cold as hell because we were off, right off the Chesapeake Bay. Look, I, like I said, I, I was born in California, but I was raised pretty much in Tucson and then Phoenix, Arizona. And, uh, and, um, uh, Aberdeen was a little cold for me, <laughs> which edge, it, it was Edgewood, which is basically Aberdeen. And, um, and that, uh, that Chesapeake Bay would come in and just slice through like th through us. And, uh, it was something. So anyways, I'm just saying, yeah, I probably heard it, but all I remember was, Man, these BDUs are not helping. <laughs> uh, so it says, um, it's a, so he basically says it's terrible in the best possible way. Okay, so now I'm going to find it. It's going to be on YouTube. Uh, love all the content you provide. Cheers, brother. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's, that's awesome. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, all right. <laughs> there are little, little war stories, kind of, sort of, sort of speak. All right, uh, Travis says, hey, uh, Phil, inherited a my granddad's Martin D35. It has no truss rod. Action is very low near the nut. When it's time, uh, when it is time for a neck reset, what should I know? Um, what should you know? Well, okay, so 
let's let's clarify a couple things here. You're saying the action is very low. That's good, actually. So you know, that's an easier problem to deal with on that guitar than if the action is really high. Okay, so the action being a little low is good because uh, it depends on where the action is low at. You know what I mean? If it's mostly low from the fifth fret to the zero fret, open fret, open, you know, I should say, um, then there's a couple things you can do. I would suggest at that point maybe going up a string gauge and putting more tension if that's a problem. And when I say the action's too low, is it if it's buzzing, if you're having trouble. To me, the, the only complaint about action being too low for most players is it's buzzing. Uh, and you're having issues or you're not getting all the volume out of the guitar. So if you have a problem with that guitar between open to the fifth fret buzzing, I would go up a stage, a gauge of strings uh, very lightly, and then that might correct the problem. In fact, most cases will. However, if you're finding the actions low between the fifth fret uh, to the last fret, then I would look at the bridge and maybe uh, shim it up or put a new bridge in it. Very easy thing either way. Um, but first, I wouldn't, me personally, I wouldn't cut you a new bridge and do that first until I shimmed it. I would shimmed it first. Super easy thing to do. <laughs> you can use cardboard if you want, just to, just to check things. Uh, cardboard, plastic, you know, you name it. It's a shim. <laughs> it's a fast Google search will figure it out. Anything that you can stick in there to raise the bridge up, raise the bridge up and check that out too. Either way, you could probably do that. Again, it's a little hard when we do these kind of verbal things. It's hard because I'm not looking at it. But uh, the good news is a good. that's a good problem to have. Uh, uh, when it comes to a neck reset, I wouldn't even consider that until, until you try these other simple things to see if that helps. There you go. Because like I said, in my experience, the problem is always the, the the other, the latter. It's always the action's too high. And that is a nightmare because the neck has no truss rod. So uh, it's hard. That's hard, man. <laughs> it's hard. But the neck uh, having a backbow to it is, uh, well, it's what was hopefully intended. So, you know, it's, you know, I mean, your neck, the, the, the goal of a great guitar is the neck to want to be straight. That's the, a good piece of wood, you know, a great piece of wood wants to be straight. And uh, and uh, and do you know and make make the action low. Um, Thomas says, "Cheers, Phil. I have an R9, okay, uh, with no wire ABR one bridge. Uh, when I adjust the intonation screws, they lift up and other slots. What am I doing wrong? You're not doing anything wrong. So what he's talking about, obviously, the R9 is a a very amazing Gibson that costs a very amazing price. <laughs> not gonna lie." That's, if I could ever swing that justification, that's uh, the R7, the R9s are just, there's like a thing. I don't know what it is. We all just kind of want one. So it's like the, uh, everybody wants one. Uh, so what he means is, so on his ABR bridge, on his, uh, on his bridge, there's a little retaining wire. Okay. Literally, uh, literally a thin piece of wire. And what it does is it runs on top or actually behind all these screws. And when you're doing the intonation, it stops them from from the saddles from popping out what he's talking about. Um, and my guess is I can't remember offhand. So, you know, I, I would love to, and if somebody knows, cause they have the guitar, um, I've maybe touched one R nine, maybe two, maybe, uh, you know what I mean? If I did a setup on one, it was, I don't even remember. Uh, so the reason I'm telling you that is I don't remember if it's supposed to have the retaining wire or not. Um, it's a, it depends. Certain guitars have them and some don't. I'm sure it has to do with the age and the, re, the, the the model they're recreating and all that stuff. So my question is, if it if it's missing the wire, then you just get one. Problem solved. If it doesn't have the wire, well, then just I would get the ABS bridge that has it because <laughs> it's a it's a better thing. Um, other than that, you know, you're not doing anything wrong. It's a it's why the wire was there in the first place. Okay, let me go back to the main page and see what you guys are talking about. Um, okay, hold on. I'm trying to just, I'm trying to hop around and see if Um, okay. So basically, um, I'm going to hit this question. Leonardo's question is, Hey Phil, have you seen that 
Mateus Asato left social media this week for the pressure of making perfect 60 second videos for Instagram. Uh, how do you feel about that? Have you experienced this burnout? Um, the, you know, you get a lot of warning when you start making any kind of content on social media. And what I mean by warning is there's all kinds of warnings. There's all kinds of things that you uh, are aware of. Um, but like a lot of things in life, till you experience them, they're not real. And uh, I don't mean like, you know, trolls or triggers or whatever the heck it is. The one of the things that they tell you is YouTube, Instagram, uh, TikTok, they are a marathon, not a sprint. And so that basically it's all about you. And what I mean by that and what you learn, which you kind of like said that statement says it all is you will not be successful on this platform if you do not continually make stuff. And it's it, the burnout comes from different directions. Sure. Of course you burn out, you get bored. <laughs> How many times are you gonna be like, look at this guitar. It's got tuners and then it's got a headstock and then it's a fretboard. <laughs> right? I'm sure it, you know, if you make jokes, of course it gets a little, anybody's job can become a little mundane. I'm sure. Of course. But the problem is, is sometimes you feel like some of the things you do that have momentum should be enough to carry you for a little while. So let me give you an example. Like you hit a video and you're like, hit it out of the park. And you're like, that video is getting the views. You're like taking next week off. <laughs> and you're like, nope. Cause YouTube does not reward uh, anyone who doesn't make content constantly. So you know, will burn out. And so I only say that because look, no one wants to hear uh, anyone's woes, especially mine. It's, it's dumb YouTuber woes, but I tell you that because again, like I said, I know not only you guitar players uh, that are watching the channel, you guys are podcasters, you are content creators and, or you maybe own businesses and you're going to have, you know, you do this part of this thing. And so, uh, I have learned, uh, that even then I still make mistakes, uh, by mistakes. I mean, it still doesn't work that way. I've learned to pace myself. I say it all the time. And I, I think, again, maybe a subject like this, this scenario today, uh, what Leonardo's talking about, maybe kind of articulate best, articulate the problem best. I pace myself. I will not make a video a day. I will not do it. I will not make five videos a week. I cannot do it. I physically can. I physically can stand in front of a camera and do that. I can physically edit. I can physically put in the hours. But it just, it, when I increase the content by even a small fraction and start increasing, giving you more video content, I find that at first it feels great because you receive it. The views go up, some more cash comes in, things are working great, but you feel it just wear you down very quickly. It's like no one's supposed to make this much content. <laughs> um, and everybody's different. You know, uh, there are content creators out there. And uh, one of the things that makes it different for me, and, and again, this is the work life, again, things we should talk about, even though it's a guitar channel, work life balance. I love Henning Polly. He makes a video every day. He's crazy. Tyler Larson, amazing, amazing channel. Music's win makes a video every day. God bless him. They don't have kids. <laughs> I'm not saying that's an excuse. No, it is an excuse. That's my excuse. I, I want to see my kids. <laughs> I want to see my, I, I, you know, yeah, I have to work life balance everything. I have to get, you know, my other stuff done, my YouTube done and stuff. So, um, and, and I hate to say it, that has nothing to do with anything other than, uh, luckily the thing that I had going for me, uh, and I hope th this makes sense before YouTube was, I already ran a business for many, many years and was used to the concept of you have to work all the time. You have to work hard, but you have to pace yourself. You will burn out. Even all that, I've still burned out at least a dozen times so far on YouTube. <laughs> so, um, but I've never made a video where like, hey, I'm not making YouTube videos or I'm backing off for a little while. I never do that. Um, at, at the very least, uh, or very most, I'll go an extra couple of days without making the content because it's just not right. The biggest thing I will tell you, and then we'll do, kill, kill this subject because it's back to guitars, but it's the best piece of advice I could ever give anyone ever, 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 ever. If you don't, f d never never put out content that you don't are not proud of just because you need content out every YouTuber, including myself, every content creator, every Instagram or every person, every, whether it's just a person doing it for fun or a person propelling their business or a person trying to do this for a living, uh, has done it. And you, you pay the price every time. Uh, you know, you can't con the audience. They can tell when it's BS um, or when you slap together or when it's not right. It's not right. But more importantly, the reason why I tell you guys this is a little trick 
for the trolls out there, because even trolls watch this channel. Yes, the trolls watch this channel. God bless them. And uh, let me tell you a, a secret about trolls. If you ever see anyone, including myself, and you see, you can tell when I get a little upset. Everybody gets a little upset. No one's no one's bulletproof. That's, and if you are, call me and tell me how you did it. But <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, the things that get to you, the things that piss you off, the things that trigger you, the things that uh, you know rattle your brain, it's the stuff you already thought in the first place. It's just somebody calling you on the thing you already thought. So if you thought that there was a thing in that video that didn't, and you're like, ah, it's not right, but I'm going to do it because it's Tuesday at six. And if I don't get it out today, the YouTube will punish me or whatever. And you And you put it out there and then somebody calls you on it. It will sting a thousand cuts. I don't know if that doesn't even make sense what I just said. It stings a thousand stings. It cuts a thousand cuts. Whatever. It just kills you. Why? Because you know they're right. You knew it when you did it. And every time I do it, I just, oh, just, uh, there you go. That's the answer. <laughs> so that's my only advice. We'll get back to guitar stuff. <laughs> hope that helps. Uh, and I say that uh, hopefully you guys know combined between all my social medias and my podcast, I have over 113, 114 million views. So I'm not saying that to, uh, to put that out there like, haha, look at me. It's to tell you, uh, hope that answer I just gave you had some weight. <laughs> there you go. I hope that gives you some weight to the answer. So all right. Um, what do we have? We have some more questions. <laughs> we have. I have no idea where I left off. <laughs> oh, we have Guillermo. Guillermo says, hey, Phil, just purchased a USA Fender Strat Pro 2, the Professional 2. Your opinion on replacing the pickups for Octave Doctor Angel pickups uh, and other recommendations for tone question mark have a beer on me thank you for all you do this community much love uh yeah absolutely look i have no um no qualms recommending the octave doctor still which great because obviously i reviewed those pickups i told you guys i love them i put them in my strat they're still in my copper strat my copper strat is out of shot and i can't grab the camera anymore because now the new camera's uh higher resolution it's behind my monitor so it's far away <laughs> It probably means nothing to you, but right now I'm reaching past my 30 inch monitor or 27 inch monitor. Anyways, the copper strat still has, uh, uh, the angel pickups except for the bridge. I took the bridge out and I put a chopper by DiMaggio in the bridge. And, uh, for no particular reason, I just did it one night. I think I've mentioned this before. I just, I had it, I <laughs> shoved it in there. Um, I don't know if I like it more or worse. It's the same. I don't know. It's cool. But yeah, so definitely go for those. I, I, st I can't recommend them enough. I love them. Uh, the Juggernaut TV 2 says, because there was a Juggernaut TV 1, apparently, uh, says, hey, Phil, what's the deal with factory seconds and B-stocks? How jacked are they? And what sort of discount should you expect? So um, it depends. Every company, so the factory, the seconds and the B-stocks, uh, something I learned from Godan Guitars. Godan Guitars, uh, at, when I was a dealer, would sell you B-stocks. And they did it the right way. Some companies do it the right way, which is they stamp second, a, a number two in ND, into the headstock, or they stamp B stock. You know, I mean, they stamp it, they like press it in there. Some companies don't. But Godin, what they did that was always great was their, their quality assurance was so good that their B stock seconds were good guitars. And as a dealer, man, I'd get like 30, 40% off my dealer cost for those guitars. So I could... I could make some cash because the customer would expect like 20, 25% off. You know what I mean? So you're like, ah, I get it. I actually make a little bit more than if I sold you the regular guitar. It's kind of nice. Um, so to answer your question, it, uh, the B stocks and, and the factory seconds are really about how good the company uh, tolerates its own, own B stocks. Does it make sense? Some companies have a very low tolerance for it. So the B stocks look almost brand new. You hear it all the time. You hear it all the time. You hear somebody reviewing a guitar and you're like, this is a B stock or second. I can't even find the flaw. And it, because there's a trained eye, you know, Nathan, if you guys know my buddy, Nathan, who now works for Jackson guitars, Jackson Charvel custom shop, Fender custom shop and doing Jackson now who's did PRS. He does finish work. And, and, um, uh, you know, think about this. He was a guy who I, I taught, I think I taught him some stuff. And now he teaches me stuff all the time about finishes. He sees stuff that I still can't 
see like he'll show me something in the finish and, and once he shows it to me i see it but i'm like wow and it's because he's looking at it all day so uh, if you if you're around painters that's another thing i learned too painters finish work artists uh that do this stuff in this industry they're going to see problems with guitars and then they're going to mark them you know as a second or b stock and then to to the layman's like us we're going to be like i don't see any pitting or weird things in the guitar and it just depends on how how severe it is so to answer your question is good deal for the most part very rarely is the company so sloppy that their b stock is just junk uh what kind of discount that's up to the retailer and you um you know what i mean i will tell you this okay if there is a b stock or a second and they don't stamp the guitar with that it's always a good deal to buy <laughs> because when a guitar is used, whatever the be- whatever the blim, whatever the problem with the guitar is, whenever the guitar when the guitar becomes used, when it qualifies as used and you have it now as used, no one's gonna care that it had you know whatever that it had a problem before because it's you're gonna have micro scratches in it, pick scratches, play usage on it, so it will just be a used guitar like a normal new guitar. It usually doesn't get affected too much in the resale value, um, and a lot of times even if you wanted to disclose it because it's just a good thing to do, a lot of times when it gets sold to somebody else and somebody else, I mean no one can e- no one even knows. There's all kinds of B stock. You could cur- right now there's uh, 1,238 of us hanging out right now. It's very possible that there's at least a dozen to two dozen of you right now who own a used guitar that is a B stock and you have no idea you have no clue um i'm pretty sure i do well i mean i bought b stocks i've bought them as recent as this year but um i mean there could be one of these guitars behind me that i bought used as b stock so or our factory second so a uh, good deal um and of course just try to save as much scratch as you can because you know the more money in your pockets better i i like like uh, i like to have my money than other people have my money if that, i hope you probably can relate to that so um so that hopefully answers your question and uh and when anytime you're buying any of that stuff from a reputable uh retailer oh it's a no-brainer they'll all they'll all stipulate that they'll take it back so you can get it and figure out what's wrong with it and if there's a problem you send it back it's not a big deal they're willing to take a chance you're willing to take a chance so it's they do that again we understand the return policy system is there so that you will impulsively buy any company any company sweetwater any but company will tell you uh that your impulse buying uh, the returns that they get are insignificant compared to the impulse buying they get it's why mom and pops it's the thing that it's the thing that when people talk about mom and pop stores what people don't understand is look i I had a mom and pop store for 12 and a half years almost 13 years so 12 years i'll tell you everyone's like oh it must be hard to compete with guitar center's pricing and they'd say stuff to you every day and they were all wrong you're all wrong you're all wrong i I, like i said i own the store i i i I did it it was we're large one of the largest dealers in the state the hardest thing to deal with was the return policies because it's hard to compete with somebody who has enough volume that can just return things without any problems. My issue as a small dealer, and most small dealers is, if I sold this guitar right here, this green one, <laughs> so podcasters are pointing at a green guitar. If I sold this guitar and you walked out with it, well, the first thing I want to do is take your money and buy another guitar to have in the store to flip that guitar. So I'm constantly trying to churn that money, that cash. It's hard to it's hard to sit on cash and it was hard to sit on inventory. It's the hardest thing for any mid-sized to small size dealer to do. And so return policies were the hardest things for small companies. And that's why the big companies are kind of just killing them. That's what killed us, man. People would go, you know, hey, if I buy this guitar, which, you know, we do in-store credit and then we go, well, you know, we could do a cash return if, you know, if you don't like it, if it's defective. It was a tough thing to do um, because you had to keep the capital for the returns and not put that back into inventory. So uh, my point is um, support your small businesses when you can, because it's, it's a good thing to do. But also take advantage of those return policies from the bigger companies, because that's, that's the advantage they give, right? There's, there's dual advantages. The other advantage is, keep in mind, one of the things that is nice about small mom and pops is they should have less returns because they should be taking more time to help you buy the right thing. I hope that makes sense. Um, my average time with a customer, as you can see, I'm long winded, two hour talking a week guy. Um, anyone that knows me knows I just don't shut up. Uh, that's how it was in my store. (laughs) There was never anybody who, who was like, man, he just didn't give me enough information. (laughs) So, um, and, and that, uh, wasn't so much strategic as a business decision as so much as, uh, just my personality. But 
I, I, I don't think anyone ever left my store going, I don't know if I really understand what this guitar does. You know what I mean? I thought it was always took the time to do that because the competitors had that great return policy of let you try it. So Greg says, nothing. He sent me a sticker. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Um, it's a digital sticker. And um, I wish I could like digitally stick them on like on the screen. That'd be kind of cool. Scott uh, says, hey, uh, this is what Scott says. Scott says, hey, Phil, I recently purchased a Fender Princeton 68 Custom. Okay. What do you think of the stock 10-inch speaker? Is it worth upgrading to something like an Eminence uh uh, or as Alessandro SC64. Um, I did. I went down a road and I started swapping the, the, a lot of people complain about the 10 inch selection in that thing, about how it's like kind of on the cheaper side and it breaks up too fast and you can put something smoother in there. I changed it out. That's why I have two Princetons. So I have one Princeton that has a 12 inch speaker, has a green back in it. And I have one that has the stock 10 inch speaker. And I found myself in just my particular thing, my particular ear, Going back to the stock speaker every time. I just wanted to, I just like it. And uh, I tried everything, exactly what you're talking about. I tried I tried a, uh, a uh, Al Nico, Al Nico Blue speaker, 10 inch. I tried a uh, an Eminence 10 inch speaker. I tried all kinds of things. And th- don't get me wrong. First impression was always like, this is better. This is what I'm missing. But there's just something about that amp I like. I- I'm very lucky <laughs> in the idea that if this, you know, some of you guys will relate. Um, you know, I have some expensive amps. I mean, look, there's some Marshalls right there. <laughs> so, um, uh, and they're great, but deep down, if I only ca- kept one amp today, it's going to be my 68 Princeton. I don't know why I like it. I just do. I like everything about it. I like the compression of it. I like the way it plays. I like the way it sounds. I like everything about it. I think I bought mine for $650. I'm pretty sure that's what I paid for mine. Uh, I think they're a thousand dollars, 900 new. So 900, I, I probably paid six, maybe 590 for it. So I'm into it for 600 bucks. That $600 amp that I've had now for five years has made me so blissfully happy that I'm very lucky because there's just, every time I play expensive amps, I go, yeah, these are nice. They're even better, but there's not about, it's not always about better. It's not always about the, you know, this thing's better. Sometimes it's about home. That the 68 Princeton is free home. So I tell you that long, boring story to tell you that one, I like the stock speaker, but two, keep in mind that it has nothing to do with just, I found this sound that I like and I like it. I like the way it takes pedals. I just like the amp. <laughs> there you go. Fender, you're welcome for that strong endorsement of your product that <laughs> you makes you wonder why they never want to, they won't ever want to work with the channel anymore. Not really. Just, I don't think they don't want to. I just don't think they see the channel anymore as relevant to them. Uh, Scott says, no, I did Scott. Lidve, what's up, Lidve? Says, uh, the neck flexes too much. Pulling this guitar out of tune by looking at it the wrong way. Cording while standing pulls too much on the neck. What do I do? Um, Okay, so again, it's tough when it's like, that's a small piece of information, so the first thing I'm thinking is your truss rod might not have any tension on it at all. And the neck might just be at the willy nilly of the, <laughs> of, of, of just moving. Um, a truss rod, especially anything in the modern age of truss rods should not allow the necks to move too much. Uh, granted, then some necks are too thin. Some necks are glued in a certain way. We all know necks move. We all know things happen. Uh, temperature changes, stuff like that. But when you're talking about like, like I understand you're being exaggerating when you're saying uh, just looking at it wrong makes it go out. Looking at it wrong makes it go out of tune. To me, it sounds like there's no tension on the truss rod. So I check that. Um, that sometimes becomes a problem when if you put any tension on the any tension on the truss rod, now you you don't have any relief that you need. I've experienced that, especially if it's not a dual action truss rod. Um, there's things that can fix that problem. But first, let's make sure that there is something on, at least something on the truss rod so that we know the truss rod's in play and it's just not all the neck. Uh, the convert, hey, what's up? The convert says, hey, Phil. Uh, getting, everybody says, hey, Phil. Hey, Phil. Hey, hey, Phil. Uh, hey, Phil, getting into surf music, can you recommend a tremolo pedal? Also, what's the difference between a Jaguar and a Jazzmaster? Okay, so we're going to go down two roads here. So tremolo pedals, I am a horrible, horrible answer. I have a bunch of them. I like the Black Cat. Um, 
but the one I use, the one that's literally on my pedal board right now as we speak, I'm looking down, is the Tremolo TR2 by Boss. How lame is that? Love it. I love it. Now, that and the Supro Tremolo pedal, which they don't make anymore, and it's like 200 and something dollars. Um, but I love them for different reasons. And the Tremolo the, for Supro, I like that it has the, the, the drive control on it. And... I'm sure I think it'd be great for surf rock, but I don't use that for surf rock. I like the boss one. It's not the best answer. Isn't that sad? But it's the one I love. I have a bunch. I could go through all the tremolos. I probably got like 10 tremolo pedals, maybe six, <laughs> six. Now that I'm looking around six pedals, I'm obviously the one that's on my board is the, the boss one. So the boss one, <laughs> there you go. I pick it up for, you can pick it up for 16 bucks, 60 bucks used. Get that. Try there. That's great. Um, so the difference between the Jaguar and the Jazzmaster, there's a bunch of differences, but let's just get to the core of it. The first big difference is the Jaguar is a short scale, 24 inch scale. Um, and the Jazzmaster is a standard scale, 25 and a half inch. I like the Jazzmaster more than the Jaguar. It's just my, it's my cup of tea. Obviously they have different pickups and they have different selection settings, but they're kind of similar. But although there's a, there are differences between the two guitars. Sure, there's even design. Even though they look similar, there's little design differences too. But the main thing that most people pick up on is the two big players, which is the longer neck on the Jazzmaster and, of course, the more of a P90 ceramic kind of pickup in the Jazzmaster versus the single coil-esque pickup in the Jaguar. Um, so so there you go. It, it depends. I'm a Jazzmaster fan only because it it gives me that vibe, but it feels enough like my Strat and Tele to make me still feel comfortable. Um, if you like the shorter scale, I would go to the Jaguar. Ian says, uh, I got a bonus at work today. Had to get a Boss GT1. Glad my girlfriend is understanding of my gas. Yes. See, you said girlfriend. <laughs> so there you go. Now, if she bought you that GT1, you'd have to marry her. And there you go. Now you know the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but you've now successfully done what we talked about earlier, which is you've confirmed that um, basically she lets you buy the gear. So if you get married, I mean, I'm not trying to put you into marriage. I'm not that guy. Everybody should get married, but just letting you know if it happens, she's going to let you buy gear. Aaron Short Music. Hey, Aaron, what's up, buddy? Am I still digging my high vibe as my dog goes nuts? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, is it in front of me? No, where did I put it? It was behind me. It was literally what I was playing. <laughs> uh, I do. I really, really like it. Uh, my two acoustics for me are very personal. So I play my acoustic that I'm in love with at the moment. Unlike electrics, like I could pick up five different electrics and mess with them. Acoustics to me, it's like they don't even come out. They stay away until I, I'm ready for them. I play one and then I just kind of like, ah, it's not warm enough, not deep enough not bright enough. And then I switch to another one I have. Um, my tailors, uh, get a lot of circulation, uh, in the playing, but the, the high vibe is for sure, uh, up there. I really, really want a travel guitar with the high vibe system in it. High vibe is going to be selling the system separately. I reached out to them and asked them if they'd be interested in sending one and I would do an install video. I would definitely do that. Uh, and I would put it in a travel guitar to see how it works out with a travel guitar. I want to see if it, uh, so there you go. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Am I still digging it? Absolutely. And a lot. And, uh, and the next question, which is a tough thing to answer, is that you didn't ask. <laughs> it's funny. I didn't ask a question that's hard for me to say the answer. And I'm still doing it. Um, the Tonewood Amp is a great device. They're local. The, 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 the couple that owns that company is here. They're they're very nice to, to the channel. They've been very good to the channel. They're friends with my buddy Larry. Um, and I, I got nothing but good things to say about them. That all being said, uh, I'd love to say that it's a good alternative to high vibe, but I really like the high vibe more. I think the high vibe not only is it sounds a little better, but that's not the big appeal for me. It's man, that looper is the killer. It's the killer thing on it. It's a great guitar. AP says, which would you be which would be the better buy? New in terms of quality or value retention? Whoa. Okay, so now he's okay. So we're gonna hone in the question. Gibson Les Paul Classic for fifteen percent off, or a Custom Shop R nine VOS for twenty five. Well, that's an that's an easy answer. You already know the R nine. The R nine is going to hold value at if you're getting it for twenty five percent off. Well, keep in mind twenty five percent off. You're almost at the dealer cost. Depending on the dealer and the situation, they're going to be somewhere between thirty to forty percent margin on a guitar like that. 
So 25% off, you're getting, you're cutting pretty deep into the, into the dealer margin, which is nice. I mean, for you, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, um, what I'm going to say, uh, the, those guitars will hold value in the long term. Will they be worth anything? Who knows? Some are going to say yes. Some people are going to put comments. No, the reality, the reality is they don't know. We all don't know, <laughs> right? We just have guesses. And so I'm just throwing my guess. My guess is that guitars like that, uh, tend to hold value. Uh, pretty well, as long as you didn't have to take, like, let me put it this way, buying an R9 and R7 used at the right price is always a good idea. Those type of guitars, you buy one and you'll always get something close to what you paid or a little bit more. It's a little nice. It's because they're rare and people want them. Look, it's a, it's a guitar. Like I said, I want, a lot of players want, it's a very cool guitar. However, it's a hell expensive (laughs) <laughs> so, so used is a great way to, to rationalize it. So that's my way. I would go with that. Um, I have a Gibson Les Paul Classic, 15% off. Uh, I bought my Gibson Les Paul Classic for at least that, maybe 20% off. And it's worth, I'm trying to think right now. What's it worth? Um, it's not worth, it's probably worth almost what I paid for it trying to think what a, I haven't looked lately to see what a Gibson Les Paul Classic's selling for. If I was going to guess, are they what, $1,500 now used? I haven't looked because, you know, again, t- part of the problem now is, is you have to understand if you're going out there now looking at reverb and eBay at used prices and they're all inflated because we're all buying guitars because we're stuck at home still in this craziness. It's hard to say that's what things are worth. I would never want to be the one that says, you know, no one wants to be, no one wants to be the guitar equivalent of buying your house at the top of the housing market in 2007s, you know, that era. Um, you know, and, and the tr- reality is nobody knows just like everybody else. They don't know if this, if, if the, if the guitar prices stay or if they go down, my guess is they go down. The, my guess is they go up and down throughout life anyways. But I, I think that after the COVID thing, uh, backs off, I think we'll, we'll see more used product and, prices on used product will come down a lot i have no idea but down dwc dwc says no question just a tip okay so he has no question for me just something for the tip jar your show has become a must-see tv thanks for doing it uh i appreciate that (laughs) i appreciate that very much it's kind of nice right it's a it's a fun vibing thing this weird thing that we do every friday um you (laughs) I love it. There's 1,200 of us hanging out on a Friday talking about the goofiest things. And um, I always remind myself, actually, when I'm timestamping this stuff, because, you know, I get to see your comments, all the ones I'm missing right now. A lot of times I get to see them as I'm typing everything I'm saying as I'm timestamping. And uh, I think to myself all the time, man, it's funny. I used to always, uh, I always used to miss not being able to talk to people about guitar stuff. And now it's like every Friday I have a place to go talk about guitar stuff. It's kind of a it's really cool, especially during COVID. I don't think I've ever appreciated what I do or what I get to do doing these live shows, hanging out on YouTube until COVID. COVID's definitely let me understand how fun this is for me to get this. Plus, this is the only thing in my week that lets me understand what day of the week it is. <laughs> my whole week is I work pretty much every I don't want to say every day because, you know, I work for myself. So sometimes I'll take a day off and sometimes I take half days. And, you know, anybody who works from home or works for yourself, you know how it kind of works. It's like all the time working, but not really. Um, My wife says it this way. She says, Phil works every two hours. (laughs) So she's like every two hours he's working. And then so he doesn't work consistently um, like eight hours in a row. But she'll say she'll tell friends. She goes, he doesn't work eight hours in a row, but he'll work all day until it's time to go to bed every about two, you know, for two hour increments or whatever throughout the day. Um, I think that sounds right. Um, but anyways, my point is, uh, I know my whole week by on Thursday, it's always on Thursday. I go, Oh, the live show's tomorrow. And then I just, it sinks back up. And then I have the live show today. And then I know tomorrow, Saturday. And then by Monday I'm lost. And I don't know what day it is again. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Uh, Hey, I found out just uh, 20 minutes for the show. Monday's a holiday here in the United States. So look at that. I didn't even know we had a holiday coming. And to answer you guys' question, if you're going to ask me, it's a don't. I have nothing planned and I'm probably working on Monday. (laughs) Voodoo Fist says, what does Voodoo Fist say? Hey, hey, Phil, at some point, can you please offer a KYG, us KYG heads, an option to purchase a personal Skype call to ask 
you repair questions advice i'm sure there is a bunch of us here that would gladly pay for the session do i would love to do stuff like that this is the thing that keeps coming up it comes up on the patron pages comes up stuff the problem is my biggest problem so everybody's very clear is that i'm not important enough <laughs> no i don't know how that sounds horrible it sounds like i have a self-esteem issue no um i'm not uh I sometimes I tell people I don't have any time and they go, I understand, you know, you're a busy YouTuber. And I'm like, no, it's the opposite. I have, I have like, I'm, it's just me, <laughs> right? Everything gets done or not done depending on if I'm doing it. So that's the problem. It's adding things to my plate is almost impossible because I'm behind now on everything I got to do every day, uh, whether it's customers repairs on their guitars or it's the YouTube channel or it's other things. So, um, I love the idea of that. And I did do that in some frame. Um, uh, so let me get, let's just say, thank you for saying that it makes me re reiterate that I need to work on something like that. Um, not so much, it's not a revenue stream because it will never make sense. Not because again, I'm so YouTube -y cool that <laughs> the money doesn't matter. It's just it li literally it becomes, um, a, um, how do I figure out the time on this? <laughs> how do I, how do I s settle this stuff? Uh, how do I figure it out? But I will work on something, um, especially for repair things. Uh, you know what? But the, but the other problem with this too is sometimes stuff like that, I think, man, how can I take that? Let me put it to you this way, since I just let me ramble. <laughs> and you super chat me $20, let me ramble and not even answer your question properly. I, I apologize. Let me, let me tell you, let me ask you guys this. And then if you have suggestions given to me, I would love to do what Voodoo Fist says but then be able to share it with everyone. Cause that's what I learned. Every time I'm one-on-one -on -one with anyone, when you send me emails and I take the time and answer emails or I send a video response or I send a type response, all I think is, man, that energy is towards one person. And what I've learned on this platform in this world is if we spread that energy out, like Sharpen My Axe was solely to so show you, hey, somebody won a guitar and I modded a guitar. One person benefited, but my, my instinct was, well, can't I take that? Instead of one person getting something out of it, can't we spread it to everyone? So to Voodoo Fist's uh, suggestion, I love the idea. So maybe it's not so much that I need to do one-on-one -on -one repair advice, but maybe... Um, maybe we could figure out how I can maybe tailor that into a video spot, a video of maybe three or four guitars where I give advice on each guitar. I would love your guys' suggestions on that. Most of the stuff I do that's successful on this channel, it's either, if it is my idea, it came from something you guys suggested or it's your guys' idea. Like I said, Sharp Max, not my idea. Somebody gave me that name. Somebody, you guys suggested, you guys suggested something like it and then I morphed it into that. Everything is... This live show, not an idea. <laughs> Got no credit for none of this stuff. Like, hey, I should do a weekly show where I answer questions and talk about guitars. Nope. I literally just started dorking around on the internet on my live, trying the live button out, and then you guys started showing up, and this is what it turned into. You evolved into this. So... Uh, Chris, Chris says, Hey Phil, I just got a new seven string PRS, but it seems to push my Katana 50 watt a little too hard. I typically play in the one, uh, one, one half or half watt mode. I'm sorry. Do I need a new amp? No, you don't need a new amp. You need to do a couple things though. First, if you're pushing your amp, first of all, you're in the half watt mode. So you have to understand whether the amp solid state or it's tube, it's what it's simulating is exactly that. The, the whole point of decreasing the wattage is to get the amp to break over. So what you need to do is two things. First, check your pickup height. That's a no brainer. Let's do that. So especially on a seven string, those low strings, man, uh, there's a reason why the band, the guys in corn play, uh, uh, seven strings with PAF pickups, path pickups, lower output pickups, you know, right? Uh, back those pickups off a little bit. That's the first thing I would do. Just lower the pickups, figure out where they are at, back them off. Second thing I would do is in that particular case, if it was me, I would increase the wattage of the amp uh, to a higher increment. I, I don't remember off the top of my head what the 50 watt uh, increments are. It's like half watt, five watt. I'm making this up because I don't remember guys. Uh, half watt, five watt, you know, 25 watt, whatever. Pick a higher wattage and then turn the volume down and that will solve the problem. Because right now the amp's breaking up. Think about this. What's happening to you is by design. It was designed to do that. 
It's designed to simulate what it's like to overdrive a low wattage amp, like a champ, like a Fender champ. You know, you take a Fender champ and and uh, it's not about being a clean amp. A lot of Fender amps that are small wattage amps, they're like my Princeton. It's not about being clean. It's about breaking up at, at a reasonable volume because it, it's a small wattage amp. So that's what I would do. Grumpy Mike Guitar says, for the tip jar. Oh, the tone jar. It's a tone tip jar. Tip tone jar. Says, and why not? And my Two Ninja just arrived. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys for supporting the Two Ninja guy. Um, very cool. You know, as, uh, you'll, you guys probably could talk about this too. Uh, did you notice? Everybody keeps asking me, uh, how is the magnet? Will it fall? This magnet is so freaking powerful. <laughs> I actually just want to get a couple of these and... Uh, Put them on my fridge. <laughs> so, all right, let's go to non-super chat questions. I'm not vintage. I'm old. Is that Phil's dog barking or mine? It's mine. And I used to, I used to on the live shows, my family used to go on lockdown for the live show. So um, they all had to jump off the internet. They all had to like, they couldn't have their devices on. They all had to be quiet and the dogs had to be brought in the house and they couldn't be out in the backyard because I have a side yard and my office that I'm in right now is on my, it's, I'm facing the side of my house. So it's my, even though I'm in the second story of the house, I mean, literally my dog's like outside the window. And, um, uh, basically at some point you guys can understand because of COVID, I decided, I told my wife and my kids, I didn't tell the dogs cause you know, <laughs> they're not they don't have a they don't have any input on <laughs> what happens but I basically told them I said please stop doing that so my family can do whatever they want and the dogs can run around barking and I said look everybody will understand you guys understand right I don't, I don't want to lock down my family even if it's just for two hours a week they're already locked everybody's locked down enough no one needs extra lockdown right now and so if you hear dogs barking it's just just it's just life man it's just life dogs bark screws fall out all the time it's an unperfect place <laughs> there's a quote for you um uh, so, Lee says, I think it's La, La, the, La, the, L E space T H, La, 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 says dogs are awesome, better than most people. Sometimes, depends. My dogs have a lot of personality. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying that they kind of do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> so I love them and they're fun, but you know, they're the ones, they have the kind of personality where sometimes they can't, sometimes you're like, they love us so much. And then you're like, Wait a minute. Do they love us or are they messing with us? It's kind of funny. Uh, oh, here's one. Uh, conservative-minded Ken. Okay. <laughs> it says, uh, conservative-minded Ken says, I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate what you do. P.S. Just ordered a Godin Session HT. Thank you for letting us know about them. Yeah, that's a that Godin is great, isn't it? Um, I, like I said, that definitely... Oh, definitely. I think my, my most, I think most underrated brand for quality and, and, uh, for the prices. The only thing that makes me sad is about Godan is they used to be even a lot cheaper. They, you know, even them have worked up the prices over the years, but man, there, there was a time where they were silly inexpensive. So, you know, since we talk about Godan, I should always remember, I remind you guys of this. A lot of guys have, a lot of players don't like buying, uh, certain types of guitars like made from China. That's the thing. Again, I'm not here to judge anybody. Um, uh, I, I like to basically present all ideas on the channel. It's just guitars. We love guitars, but we, I think it's fair to talk about the issues with guitars. And and so what I always r remind people is is that uh, Godan, which is uh, Arts and Luthery, and Simon Patrick, which is a more expensive line, and Siegel um, offer a lot of guitars in the price points of import Asian brands with a, you know, so you can get something that's made in North America, which is Canada, something to know. And I just like to tell you that because um, I think it's I think everybody should have the right to buy what they want. The market decides. The, uh, we decide, not not the other way around. So, uh, and I think a lot of times uh, in electric guitars, it's a very easy proposition. If you don't want to buy an import guitar. And whenever I say import, there's people outside the U.S. who are like, Every, everything's an import to us, including U.S., but that's not what we mean. I think import is a slang. It means Asian guitars. I think that as a, as a, as a group of musicians, we all seem to understand that. Um, and we all respect and, and like them, I think. I do. But sometimes you want to support other uh, other uh, types of territories of, of manufacturing. And so I like to let you guys know where all they're, all they're made. So there you go, just so you know. Since you know about the Godans. 
John uh, says uh, he loves the Seagull. Uh, they're fantastic. I have an Arts and Luthery. That's one of the other guitars I play a ton of. And I I think I bought that years ago, but I think I paid 300 bucks for it. Fantastic guitar. So. The... Um, Sean Brooks says, uh, oh, he's talking to me. He was saying his Epiphone is great. I'm just looking at comments that maybe. And again, if, if, if uh, you're talking to me, put a question mark first. Okay, we have, (laughs) Okay, so I have other pin questions besides super chats. I told you I try to grab questions too. I'm trying to trying to improve this and kind of smooth out all the questions. I'm looking for the most interesting topics, always of course. And so this one came from Deadfish. I don't know why it just I made me grab it, but it says Deadfish says, "How's it going? Been drinking today, and I'm going, uh, and I'm doing some drunk online shopping. Wish me luck." I love that statement. First of all, because you're not that drunk because you did the double question marks first. So you can follow directions, which means you're probably still within the range of acceptable drinking at this point. Um, but uh, what I love about that is a great topic to talk about. I, I I have to tell you, when Eddie died, Eddie Van Halen died, I was really upset. <laughs> I think a lot of us were. It just really hit us to the core. And I, you know, I hate kind of rehashing it now, bringing up a bad memory. But um, that night... I, uh, I can't say I got drunk. I mean, I definitely get drunk for, for, for often enough, but, uh, (laughs) but that night, man, I was definitely tipsy and that resulted in me getting another LBX amp and that white Wolfgang. And I can tell you a very few times in my life, much less, but in the, you know, in this guitar time, have I ever drank and then go, I made a purchase, but that night, oh, those are both purchases. Not that I regret them. I just don't understand why I bought them. (laughs) It was purely just how upset I was. It was just, I felt like I needed, here's why I have a beautiful, I can't point to it. (laughs) There you go. If you're uh, listening to the podcast, I'm pointing to my purple Wolfgang uh, PV guitar. And so I'm like, why did I, I didn't need another Wolfgang and I bought it. And uh, so uh, that's my thing saying, I relate. I understand what you're saying. It's a, it's a funny thing. Um, I, (laughs) I can't tell you who. I just wish I, I, if I knew I was going to talk about this subject, I would have got it cleared. I was talking to a manufacturer this week and that does custom builds. And they were telling me that one of their problems as of late in the last year is they get custom builds and they get the order, which, and then they start building it. And then when it's done, they call the customer and the customer's like, well, I didn't order that. And they're like, yeah, you ordered it. And they're like, you, you ordered it and you, and they go, no. And then they go, oh, I was drinking. <laughs> and when they told me that, I go, are, are you kidding? And they're like, no. And I go, people are drinking, buying custom built guitars and not realizing it. So maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe we all need some more interventions. Um, Sean says, I need a drink before buying a PRS core. I have an eye on. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't recommend that though. Not the core. I recommend the guitar. It's great. But. I don't recommend the drink before the buy. In fact, I think what you should do if you're drinking, here's some advice. Usually we try to build this channel on some some good advice. Here's some good advice. If you're drinking, instead of buying a guitar, maybe put the guitar in the cart <laughs> for tomorrow when you wake up and then you can look in your cart and go, okay, I'm, I'm, I've, I've thought about it. That's, uh, that's my practical way of the, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, sir, 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 loin, sir, uh, says I did that when Alex Leho died. Am I saying Leho? Uh, I don't know much. I'm old. (laughs) Uh, one day a kid came in my store. Remember when Screamo came out? Screamo music, the, for those of you, some of you are like, Hey, what are you talking about? Screamo's, uh, anyways, Screamo music came out. And there's a local band here called uh, Kids Scaring Kids, or maybe it's Scary Kids Scaring Kids. And, uh, you know, and that's, uh, you know, y- young players were like, you got to check this out. So I bought their CDs, loved it. And I loved it so much, I asked these kids, I said, well, what else should I be checking out? And um, they said, uh, uh, what did they say? Uh, Alex's band. What, why, why are there space? What is band's called? 
And uh, Children of Bodom. Thank you. To myself. <laughs> so Children of Bodom. So I got Children of Bodom next. And um, and I loved it. It was one of those things, man. I just, you know, I love, I love stuff like that. So I loved it. And then uh, it's weird as an old dude, uh, you, you know, looking at the, because again, it's old as perspective, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it's not an age. It's a perspective. So obviously, you know, uh, in music genres. So here's what's funny about that. I saw, I got to see Alex uh, uh, play with George Lynch at this Nam thing. And George Lynch is a fantastic guitar player, but you could tell Alex was just amazing. He's a great guitar player. So, yeah, it's a, that's a horrible loss. And, we, you know, think about this. We lost Chick Corea this week. Another huge, horrible loss. As, as, as the COVID times suck, which is why we're going to talk about some fun stuff. I'll take you out of that. We don't have to go down the... Uh, yeah, everything sucks world. <laughs> uh, Front Level Midnight says, yikes, did I do something wrong? I'm just reading this for myself, guys, but I'm reading it out to you. Uh, I super chatted my question in multiple, multiple, at have, okay, let's look. Let me find you where you're at. Um, I don't know why you're not, I'm not seeing it. I see you, buddy. Okay, so I'll jump around. I'll go back to some other Super Chats so I don't forget you guys, but I'm going to grab Fret Level Midnight's. Uh, so he's, you know, because I understand. You're a little concerned. You know, want to make sure your stuff's getting seen out there. Uh, it says, um, okay, he said, I've, S, okay, I've, I've, I've said this before. I think it said, I don't know, this before. PV Blue Marvel opinions. So Blue Marvel are the speakers in the PVs. I like PV speakers. I like PV. Not now. <laughs> uh, I don't hate them. I, I, I don't dislike the, the, the product of the company in a way, but they're not the company they used to be. They're not by no by no more means worse than any other of the companies that are in their market range. But PV used to be something special. And, uh, and think about this. It was definitely one of those things. Uh, I hope a lesson learned for all of us that we didn't even realize why it was special at the time. You know what I mean? We were just totally oblivious. We had no idea. You know, to us, PV was just like, oh, it's the cheaper version of a Fender. It's the cheaper version of this, of a PRS. Uh, you know, I, I look back as a bass player thinking about the Cirrus basses and how those basses were in league with, you know, four or $5,000 basses made in the USA, for Christ's sakes. I mean, just beautiful product. And, um, you know, now it's not the that's not the same company anymore. And I'm and if you're a PV fan and I'm triggering you right now, well, I'm sorry, but yeah, I think you're just not being realistic. I'm still a PV fan, but let's be clear, there's not you can you can there's nothing wrong with liking the new product, but you gotta be aware of the fact that it, the old product was special. And here's why we know it was special. Because they were getting the goat of all the big companies. They were those companies were, you know, paying attention. Hartley Peavy got all the big players to pay attention to what he was doing because he was essentially, I don't want to say knocking people off. That sounds like that's like belittling what he did. Uh, he was essentially making affordable versions of stuff uh, in the United States. It was really important, impor powerful. Uh, Al John's here. Hey, Al John. He says, I was a PV endorser back when I was tour a touring guy. Great stuff and still a fan of the brand. Yeah, it's like I said, it's, 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 I'm a fan. And I guess that's a better way to put it. I'm a fan of the brand, but that fandom comes from it's like liking a, a band for their first three albums not loving their last three albums but still buying them that's how i look at pv now i like pv i do and i would buy pv but i love pv because of their first three albums not because the last three so uh let's see uh Hold on, I'm just looking at comments to see. Lots of comments. See, a lot of you guys are basically echoing the sound, or echoing what I said, which is, yeah, there's a lot of great PV stuff. Okay, so the next question we're going to hit, since I jumped around and lost track, but I'm back on track now. Uh... 
I'm going to say AA. <laughs> okay, so AA says, uh, learning a lot watching your content. Thank you. Thank you so much for the super chat and for joining the live show. Ethan says, PRS Baritone, 11 to 68, tuned to drop B flat. Truss rod is fully tightened, but there is still some neck relief. Okay. Uh, 11 to 68 doesn't sound... I mean, that 68 is a big ass string, but it doesn't sound like that should be happening. Super cold and probably dry in Michigan. That should help. Usually that stuff creates more of the back bow. And, and, and again, every experience is different. Every guitar is different. But usually uh, when it gets cold and dry, that's when you notice all of a sudden your strings are, are, are laying on the fretboards because the neck's kind of like whoosh, straightened out. It's not the other way around where it's, where it's kind of got too much relief. And you're dealing with too much relief, right? Yeah, too much neck relief. Um, is there any cause for concern? Um, well, concern is a tricky thing. But yeah, it doesn't... I mean, my experience with the PRS baritone guitars and guitars of that quality, with that gauge in that tuning, you should definitely be able to... Because even though 68 is a big string, I mean, you're B-flat, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's down-tuned. Um I, I think I, I, I would have to do the math, but I'm pretty sure 11 to 68 on a six string guitar tuned to B flat wouldn't be different than tuned B. No, actually it'd be less tension should be than a seven string guitar. Maybe let's maybe nine to 52s in B. So the guitar, the neck should take it is what I'm saying. So yes. Should you be concerned? Um, yeah, it needs to be addressed. I would have it. I would. I would definitely look at that. Um, the thing that you need to pay attention to, and it's again, I always have to assume. Let's just please for safety for everybody. Let's just assume that you may not know every single thing about that guitar. That guitar does have a dual action truss rod. So what that means is, if you turn, and again, I'm, I, you know, if you turn one way, you're going to be. Uh, tightening the truss rod and straightening the neck and then you turn it another way at some point it gets to center where it's like loose and you're going to think that's the end but if you keep going if you keep turning now we'll turn and it'll force the neck instead of straight it actually will put a bow in it it will put a little bow in it so um you might uh have too much relief because your truss rod is actually putting the relief in the guitar it's not letting it happen it's like physically putting the relief in the guitar that guitar that prs guitar whether it's made in indonesia or in the court tech factory or if it's made in the uh in the uh, world manufacturing factory uh in my experience working on them there there is no reason why you should have that issue with that guitar so the only issue you should possibly have with a guitar like that is that once you have the neck as straight as you want it, you might have some buzzing issues. That might be high frets that you would have to address. That stuff will happen. But, uh, but the quality uh, to, to me, to say you saying that you've tightened it fully and you still have relief, even with that, uh, string gauge at that tuning doesn't sound right, but I'm hoping that I'm right. And you just didn't, you need to go the other way, go the other way. You got a 50, 50 chance to get it right, buddy. Go, go one way and then just go the other way. You'll feel it when it gets to the center because it'll just get loose. You'll think it's done. And then it just goes the other way. Sarang says, happy Friday with a PH. That's awesome. Friday, Phil. Wanted to say that I really appreciate the hang every week with everything going on uh, now. This now feels like a seminar with friends exchanging knowledge and sharing the fun. Yeah, it is kind of fun, right? I I'm, I'm, I'm appreciate you guys hanging out. It's uh, it's nice to talk about guitars. It's something else to talk about for sure. Dale, um, oh, you know what's funny? I'm going to go on a segue. There's, you know, sometimes when I'm asking your questions, um, I wanted to talk about something that happened. Uh, let's see if I can find it on the internet. <laughs> it just made me, uh, chuckle. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So I don't know if you guys saw, there was an article this week, um, on guitar world. Let me go to guitar world and guitarworld.com. And it was about, uh, they seized a bunch of fake Gibsons and it was like it was funny because it was like 26 Gibson guitars fakes and like a couple fenders and one PRS and they were fakes and what's weird is let me see if I can find it because it's what I hated about the article was it was there and then it disappeared so I got to find it. it was in there searching it 
Oh, now I froze everything. Okay, there. Is that better? Did I glitch out for a second? <laughs> I feel like it glitched out. Maybe I was just working it too, the computer too hard. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to point this out. I thought it was funny. Here it is. I'm going to share it with you guys. Let me go to my screen share. Webpage. Oh, is that better? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> when I went to the web screen, uh, I apparently I don't have a mic uh, assigned to that channel. I apologize. So basically, uh, what we were going to talk about was uh, is that what made me laugh was what I came up with was like three to five thousand dollars worth of guitars. <laughs> So uh, I just thought I'd share the story. I wanted to share the story because there was a lot of discussion I saw on the internet about uh, what they should do with these guitars. And I thought it was just an interesting talk. Um, <laughs> somebody says the dogs ate Phil. Um, yeah, everybody's like, you're back. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so I just thought it was an interesting article. I wanted to put it, I'll put a link to it in the description. It was a really interesting read, but it was really funny because like I said, uh, it, it's, it's funny. They, I know they need the sensationalism click, but it was definitely more like $4,000 for the guitars. But still, I see their point. I just wanted to share. Uh, Ross Holmes says, Phil, I noticed the two silver strats. I mean, the PRS hanging up. Uh, have you done a video on them? Yeah, both guitars. This is uh, one of them is the John Mayer Silver Sky and one is the uh, Squire that I had plecked. Uh, and they're out for a reason. Uh, usually if there's something behind me, it's because I'm working on something or a, whether it's a video or I was doing something. And um, and uh, you're going to be seeing the Squire uh, in another video very soon. Uh, I'm going to be doing a video on, because a lot of people, I like to read the questions sometimes or the comments sometimes in a video and then kind of figure out if there's another interesting way to talk about something. And uh, the uh, the one of the questions everybody had were about the squire being plucked was will it does it will it hold will the squire, you know will the pluck job stay stay uh, legitimate and um and what was going to say uh basically i'm going to do an update explain uh, where the guitar is now after a month how is it play does it still play as good was there any issues and something else <laughs> there's going to be something else something interesting i can't talk about so i can give you a piece of information but not all of it All right, next question. How are we doing time? We got we got about 10 more minutes. So we're going to have to see if we can get... Uh, Dale... Whoops. Oh, Dale, uh, Dale says, Hey, Phil, thanks for the Eastwood guy talk the other day. I have one of the Eastwood uh, uh, Languidoc guitars. And, uh, and I talked to Freddie and ordered one of the Fred... Languidox for 800 bucks two days ago. That's awesome. So what he's talking about is, so I have a couple videos coming uh, that are more additional podcasts. I, I, the patrons get to see just that. That's the you know, whole point of having a patron page. I'm trying to give them a little something so that justifies why they support the channel. They make it possible so you guys watch the live show. They, that's why there's no sponsor for the live show. Um, they make it possible if you watch a lot of the videos I do. I, 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 I self-sponsor using you guys as much as I can so I don't have to minimizes the amount of working with companies as possible. Let's just make content in a way that I think is 
is driven by us. And so anyway, so what Dale's talking about is that video was given to them. They were, they see the, they get to see the, um, the Eastwood review our uh, podcast. You guys will see it next week <laughs> and yours will be a short, shorter version, but not for any reason other than, um, it'll be streamed on, you know, to make it a little easier. So they, they get to see, so I'm glad he liked it. Uh, I had an amazing time doing that podcast. It's just like when I did the uh, podcast with Jack from, uh, PRS and other podcasts like Sammy Ash, we'll do it. We have another Sammy Ash coming soon, uh, podcast I'm excited about and uh, a couple other podcasts that are exciting. Uh, let's see. ISO guitar says been watching you for years, but rarely catch the live show. Thanks for the entertainment and, and tips. Any chance of ever bringing back the gold, uh, top shirts? So, uh, yes, I, they're not out now. <laughs> I don't, I, I need to, I'll ask my wife, uh, when I get off, when I get off the air live, um, if they exist, I thought they were still on the main page. I know this, um, I put a link to the shirts down below and, uh, you know, I know that's the shtick of YouTubers. Hey, buy my crap. But in the terms of buy my crap, uh, I do need to tell you so I don't uh, short myself or you guys. Uh, we're at 296,000 subscribers. I think I'm about to roll 297 in the next day or so. The only thing that's important about that is every 100,000 subscribers, I change the logo to the shirts. Now, so you know, don't worry. There's no crazy new logo company. This is the actual one you can't get anymore. This one is the logo uh, that is from the first 100,000 subs. So this is a pre, you have to have, so the reason I, I tell you this is this is something I do. It's for me. But I want you to be aware of it, why I'm doing it. Every 100,000 subs, so the 100,000, 200, and now the 300,000, that will, at 300,000 subscribers, we'll now have our fourth logoed shirt, which means the fourth change to the logo. And the reason being is it lets me know when you came in. <laughs> so when I see your shirts, um, we have sold an insane amount of shirts over the years. Uh, I, I don't feel comfortable telling anybody, but I can tell you this, we could... We could fill a large, very large venue, a rock star esque venue with the amount of shirts we sold. It's been pretty an amazing thing. So um, I appreciate all that, and that's kind of like you know something I do that's fun for me. So I'm just letting you guys know um, if you're thinking about getting the current logos before they change again, if that's something you, you're into, just be aware that the logo will change in about a month. I think it, it's going to be a few more weeks before we hit 300,000 subs. And then we'll do something for 300,000 subs. We'll do something fun like we did before. But I'll just let you know about the shirt deal or the shirts. Um, Charles says, Charles' question is, hey, Phil, big fan since I found your channel about six months ago. My question is, uh, is there a base magazine that you would recommend? Thanks. Um, no. <laughs> uh, so no, for no particular reason. Let me put it this way. Um, the last time I bought a guitar magazine, uh, and, and just again, just to be truthfully transparent, uh, I the last time I bought a guitar magazine was two years ago when I was in one. Uh, guitar World did an article about my video, and it was on the front page of the Guitar Mag World. And so, I mean, like, you know, it wasn't about, it wasn't me. They didn't, you know, I think they interviewed me. I can't remember, but I'm in it because it's my, it's my video that caused the article. Um, so I bought that one. I have no idea why. <laughs> and then the one before that was in 2009. And I remember, I remember it was 2009 because I was flying to Maryland and, um, uh, I didn't know the airline that we picked didn't have an in-flight movie. So in the airport, I bought a guitar magazine. That's the last guitar magazine I bought, 2009 besides the, the and, and that's actually the last one I read. The one I bought with me in it, I didn't even read the article. <laughs> I just like, oh, I was in the mag. Actually, it was just, I, you know, I, it was like I said, it was about my video. Um, so I say that for no re reason other than I, you know, I used to be the guy that buys all the magazines and looks at the ads and stuff for years and years and years. But then it just YouTube killed it for me. I started watching Chapman and, and, uh, you know, the Tone King and, and, um, and, uh, Scott Grove and Fluff. Those were the guys I was watching. Once I saw those guys, I was like, oh, this is way cooler. I have no, no, no qualms telling you guys this. I had no intention at all to ever be on YouTube was not my goal. <laughs> I, I would have probably bought a camera and a computer 
or at least did something at the beginning if I thought this was gonna be a thing. I literally was just making videos on my phone like a lot of you guys make, just putting something out there and then started a conversation and then it started growing. Um, but I did it because of a ton of reasons, but mostly, uh, keep in mind at that time, man, I was just loving the having that stuff to watch. I once spent a week and just binge watched every Glenn Fricker video. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the whole my wife thought I was crazy. She's like, "What the hell are you watching?" Because all she could hear was Glenn screaming. <laughs> and I like I watched been watched his entire show uh, for for uh, uh, and so those are the guys I was watching at that time. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Okay, we're I'm just looking at time too, guys. All right. Uh, Mike Mooney did a super chat just to say thank you. I appreciate that, buddy. And uh, Barney did a super chat saying, hey, I got a a binding G-string on the new Core PRS. Tune it. Lube solved the sticking tuning issue. Should I still file the nut? Uh, no. If the lube fixed the issue, I would not worry about it. Um, if you used any of the lubricant or Big Ben's nut sauce, that stuff's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, I say that only because I don't know what your skill set is. I would not recommend you file on a core PRS nut if you're not, you know, familiar with it. <laughs> so if you are, yeah, of course, then you don't have to use the, cause I mean, think about this. You shouldn't have to lubricate the nut. I say that, but almost all my guitar, uh, guitar nuts are lubricated. Um, just even the ones that don't have tremolos, I just kind of do it. It's a habit. I have like literally no joke. <laughs> I have, if, if you didn't know what this stuff was, you would think that, uh, you, yeah, Phil's got a problem, right? This is like, what's, why is there drug needles all around his house? And that, yeah, I have these things everywhere. Um, because, uh, this is, uh, so, you know, um, for, I can't see the camera used to be right in front of me. Now it's way behind me and, but it zoomed in. So this is, oh, but I have this camera. Look at that. Dun, 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 dun with a dog hair on it. Look at that. Okay. So lubricate. Do I, can I focus with this camera? There you go. Yeah. Lubricant. Friction remover. Look at that. Almost professional around here. Anyways, uh, so yeah, I use that stuff. It's great. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if you know how to do it, uh, you can smooth out the nut and not have to worry about this stuff, but I still use it anyways. Mr. Fancy Hand says, at what price tag do you think guitar stopped getting objectively better and start being about personal taste sh sh sure uh well of course that's that the question that question is actually a question about brand so you could never you can never take such a broad sh stroke and say I, I hear it all the time like there's all guitars at 500 dollars are good that's not true there are companies that make horrible guitars for $500 and some companies do it intentionally some good companies want the price to be higher so they make their lower price guitars, not as good as others. There's obviously evident proof of that, right? Companies all the time are making, look, Ibanez is not going to make you the same quality guitar as Harley Benton for $300. They're just not. They don't do it. Harley Benton makes a better $300 guitar than Ibanez's $300 guitar, in my opinion. But Ibanez makes a better guitar. Well, Harley Benton doesn't do a $700 guitar, but $700 guitar for, uh, for Ibanez. So every company is kind of known for having a sweet spot too, where the guitars get good. And that's really the better conversation is instead of what price tag do they get, you know, do they stop getting better? It's where everybody's sweet spots at. And, and, and I think if you're, uh, and you don't even have to be a, a, a guitar connoisseur of all these brands to figure that out. You know, um, Epiphone's a good one for me. It changes because prices keep going up. <laughs> but there was a time where Epiphones for me, under three hundred dollars, were just horrible guitars. I just didn't like them. I would I would uh, dread working on them. And at five hundred dollars, I just felt like they were fantastic guitars. So it was like the sweet spot they hit, and it just got good. And Squire had the same issue, right? You just got to a spot, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is a this is a lot. And you see it with brands all the time, especially brands that make lower, lower price, you know, entry level student grade instruments that the, not that I'm saying those instruments are bad, but you start noticing like, in fact, to finite that even conversation anymore, there's sometimes how funny, how $50 makes such a huge difference on a guitar. Has anyone experienced this where you literally buy a guitar, you try a guitar, maybe that guitar is 300 bucks. And then you try the same brands, $350 guitar. And it's far superior how everything just opens up. So 
I think that uh, it's not so much where it stops, but where do guitars have their sweet spot for each brand? Where guitars objectively stop getting better, where where I don't believe anymore. That's actually another thing, a way to put this too, right? The, the, the term is drink the Kool-Aid, okay? Um, I've been very clear. I've not changed my, my opinion or my stat, uh, my stat, uh, my status. I have not, uh, my, uh, I have not changed my opinion. So what are basically trying to say, um, uh, in, in the entire time I've been on YouTube, expensive guitars, which everybody, when I say that word is, has conjures up a different thought. So, but when we know when I say expensive cars, luxury cars, you know, you're thinking Mercedes, high end Mercedes, Lamborghinis, all that stuff, right? High end cars. We know what that means. When we say expensive luxury guitars, expensive, crazy guitars, we know what it is. It's Paul Reed Smith core guitars. It's Gibson Les Pauls. It's Fender American guitars and custom shop guitars. It's uh, Sirs, right? It's, uh, you know, um, well, I can just look behind me. It's, um, you know, it's Gretsch's. I don't know. I can't point at it. Um, High end guitars like that. I hear it all the time. People will say, uh, no guitars as good as a Sir. And I'm like, uh, sure, that's good for you. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. I'm glad it makes you happy. I don't really feel that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, how I feel is uh, I pick up a $600 Schecter guitar, and I think that guitar is fantastic. And um, But I think a Sir guitar is a is a not a luxury guitar. It's a guitar that's des- by design. This is what I'm saying. I haven't changed my, my uh, opinion on it all these years. It's about owning something that no one else has. It's about having something truly unique. It's it's just the reality of that. It's something that's just really cool. Plus, it's it you know it's good. So there's a lot of reasons why the high-end guitars are where they are, but there's not a lot of practicality to them, and there's not a lot of logic to it. And I find more people try to apply the logic, they get frustrated with an R. They even get frustrated with an R. <laughs> they uh, literally go, oh... Um, you know, I, I don't want to get too sideways on this. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is the there's a there's a law of diminishing returns, and on most guitars, it's going to happen when the guitars get, I want to say, ten times more expensive than the average guitar. So, and that seems to be a number, right? When I see a five hundred dollar guitar, I think that's a great guitar nowadays. When I see a five thousand dollar guitar, I don't think it's ten times better. It's just not. So there's obviously a law of diminishing returns on that. And you see that a lot of bit, but, but that being said, uh, I don't take away from the fact that it's really cool to own that guitar, that high end guitar. There's something cool about that. In fact, I've said this before and I'll keep saying it over and over again. There's something cool about owning a unique guitar period. The cool thing about that, which is where one of the motivations of this channel is, is that, is that you can have a unique guitar without spending a ton of money. That's why modding guitars is so cool. You can have something unique and not something expensive. And that's just the reality of it. So, okay. Um, next one is from Music Stuff. Music Stuff says, for showing me the Duesenberg trim for the Tunematic Bridge guitar. So he's, that's why he did the super chat. Uh, my new favorite trim. I love that tremolo. Um, super responsive feel and looks cool on my Gretsch Electromatic. I think the Duesenberg tremolo is a fantastic bridge. I know when I did that video, a lot of people were like suggesting the... Uh, the um, Bigsby and the Floyd Rose and all that stuff. And I, I tried them. They're all great. But I just, for some reason, the Duesenberg one was my favorite as well. So I'm glad you really liked it because I, I, stuff like that, I just, that's the stuff I found that I like. It's not that it's the best. It's just what I liked. So I'm glad I, this means our tastes are aligned, so to speak, in that, in the way that it feels. Tremolos to me are a two, two, two part, uh, I don't know where I'm going today. Two part system. You can always tell when the show gets a little long because I'm having trouble kind of keeping train of thought because it's been talking for two hours. Um, I like tremolos are about how well they stay in tune and then how they feel. And it's very important. Both are very important to me. And, uh, obviously being in tune is a mandatory, but tremolos, the way they feel, I love the way Floyd Rose's feel. They're one of my favorite feeling tremolos, uh, bridge or vibratos, whatever you want to call it. For those who get hung up on the words. So that's why I like the Vega trim so much. I love the way it feels. It's got that very Bigsby, very Floyd Rose, very soft. Uh, I like it. Everybody's got different, feel, you know, way they like the bridge to feel. I like it if I can just use my pinky, just soft and easy. Some people are more ha- heavy handed than me. So they're going to want the tremolo to feel more stiff and be a little harder to move. 
Dan says, would you buy a guitar with a decent, with decent fret wear? wear? Okay, hold on. He wants to know if I would buy a guitar that has fret wear. He says decent, but I understand what he means. In the cowboy chord area, so it's G, C, and D chord, so all in the third, you know, third, second, fourth frets, right? Okay. Um, I have t turned down a few guitars because of this issue. Uh, is it a dumb thought? Um, no, I, I try to stay away from all guitars with fret wear. The main reason is, is because, look, if you... I always tell people, if you have wear in your frets, dents in your frets, wear spots in your frets, it's not affecting the way the guitar plays or sounds, then good. Then there's no problem. Keep playing it. Um, the, my my customers that are gigging musicians, they buy guitars like that. They look at a guitar like that and they're just like, you know, it's like looking at an old work truck. It's like, man, this is nothing compared to what I'm going to do to it every week. So they're just going to abuse that guitar. However, um, my reason for not buying guitars with fretware, especially excessive but just fretware in general is is that like i've said before i play a few guitars all the time these other guitars are just either because they're collection pieces so it's just something about having it and playing it playing a few songs on it and enjoying it for the moment staring it at the wall <laughs> right there's all kinds of reasons why you own certain things you know lifelong goal to own a certain thing um and uh and so i know i'm not going to be putting the abuse on it does it make sense so uh that's why i do that so if that helps, uh, Frank did a super chat just to support the channel. I appreciate you, Frank, for doing that as I refresh the page. <laughs> uh, Wu Tech did a um, happy lunar year. Just finding another excuse to super chat. Man, I appreciate that. I do. Slate Healy says E2 are dope. So he's talking about the uh, the uh, ESP E2 guitars. Love my TH THICC Eclipse uh, LTD Elite uh, H3. I I really like really like ESP guitars. ESP guitars are. Uh, did you, anyone ever heard the story? This is a funny weird story that connects to. Uh, Paul McCartney. So Paul McCartney was interviewed once and he was explaining that uh, Fender basses, he never owned one for the longest time because uh, I think he said he didn't own one until Leo Fender gave him one. I can't remember the exact story. Please keep in mind, I'm just doing off a memory of a 15, 20 year article. He said uh, Fenders to him were expensive. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And he, I think the joke was something to the fact that like, you know, he's rich as hell now and he still thinks a Fender bass is expensive. Um, I, I like that story because it was kind of, it was nice relation because I'm like, obviously I'll never relate to all that money he has and stuff. But ESP guitars were the guitars for me that were just unobtainable. They were just unobtainable. They didn't exist. Uh, they were just too expensive. Um, uh, the guitar players that had them with Queensryche and George Lynch, you never saw them in, in, in person. I never, I, I, my whole life growing up, not had one friend had an ESP, not one. Nobody could afford them. We didn't have them. Um, you never saw them. You saw them only on MTV, <laughs> right? They were always this crazy looking, amazing guitar. Oh, Vernon Reed, right? You'd see Vernon Reed with one. Oh man, do I regret not buying the LTD Vernon Reed when they did that? Anyways, you can't find those now. Um, I didn't jump on it fast enough. So anyways, um, so basically what I'm trying to say is the first time I saw an ESP, I saw an LTD. I, I think I told you the story. I was at a guitar center and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, ESP. And it was LTD. And I'm like, what's LTD? And it was like affordable ESP. And so I started fi finding affordable uh, ESP, which is LTD. And to me, they were just always the obtainable guitars. So the E2 was my first like, oh, I actually own an ESP now <laughs> kind of thing. Um, I had an ESP George Lynch guitar. I should mention that. I did buy one used. But that all being said, I absolutely love the guitars i always have i think they just make fantastic stuff but it, it's it's funny because i feel like even though when i look at them i was i was just laughing about this the other night i think at e2s is being expensive i think at esp is being expensive and then when you look at sirs and guitars like that they're even more expensive than those yet i perceptionally i'm just being honest with you guys i know for a fact that a sir is more money than the average esp that i've seen and 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 especially e2 Okay, but in my head, ESP is more expensive. So it's weird how perceptions like that work. Um, 
Brian from Oregon says, can't believe it's been a year since I've uh, had chicken and waffles. Hey, Brian, what's up? Yeah, that was, we had chicken and waffles. When was that? That was in the NAMM show. It feels, here's what's funny. Not only can I not believe it's been a year, but it's funny how, because COVID, that was 2020 NAM that we did that, chicken and waffles. That was my first time having chicken and waffles, everybody. I think I talked about this once. And um, it was the 2020 NAM. And what's funny is it was a year ago, but it feels like every time I think about that, I think that was 2019. It was two years ago. So it's not only can I believe it's only been a year, it's, sometimes it feels like longer because the COVID thing. Um, Carl's in depth says, do you charge for reviews? I developed a power amp for pedals and I can't find anyone who will review it on YouTube without charging me. So the way I do reviews is a very different way and, uh, very different. Um, and it's been the most problematic, horrible way to do reviews ever. And to the point where I've, I've now the good news about the way I do reviews and I'm prefacing this cause it's important. I have built some of the best relationships with companies I think anybody can physically have. I, I can honestly say I have friends in this industry, good friends that like to work with this channel, um, that I will swear by a thousand times as not only good people, but the best product, right? Um, I've also have companies that I just would never work for, no matter how much money they would ever possibly even offer me. Um, because of this, because of the fact that I do th the way I do things. Um, so the way I do business, uh, so I, I'll use Ryan from six cycle home cause he's a good friend. I like his channel. I like his ethics and I like how he's up front. He's like a, I, I don't know his prices, but he posts them. So if you want to know what he charges, he's like, Hey, this is what I charge to do a video. I, I run nothing like that. Um, my first thing is, is the first thing that's important is, is do I and you mostly you want to watch the video. So, um, I think what, how I do my videos is very clear. It, like the LTD ESP, look, I, I'm no, again, I'm very transparent about everything. Uh, I bought that ESP LTD from Sweetwater. I reviewed that. Why? Because LTD's never sent me a guitar and you wanted to see it. I just bought two Reverends. Why? Because Reverend didn't want to send a guitar for review. It's not even about paying me that or giving me a guitar. I offered free content for them. They didn't want it. So I bought it. Why? Because you guys wanted it. If you guys want it, it really does matter to me. Uh, I, I try to pretend it didn't, but it does. It's not about how many views I get. It's not about that. It's about me mentally working, editing for six hours on a video, thinking about how none of you are going to give a crap about it. It's emotionally just a horrible, it, I don't even know how to explain it. it, it I do I exactly know how to explain it. So anyone here ever had the experience, whether it's at school or at a job where you spent all day working on a project for your boss or your teacher to say, oh yeah, I know we changed our mind. We're not even doing that. And you're like, wow, I don't care. You know, you, you still got a paycheck that week, but still it hurt emotionally just wiped you out. Okay. So, uh, so that's my point. So I try to make content that I want to make. So if it's content that I want to make or that I think you want to see, I'll pay for it. I'll buy it. I'll do it for free. Uh, what happens though, is then there's another level and here's another level. There's a lot of people that reach out to me and they don't understand. And this is what try ties into what you're doing. Um, so, so, uh, Carl's in depth, uh, you have developed a power amp for pedals and you can't find anyone who review it. Well, here's the problem. <laughs> okay. It's not about charging you. Okay. The first problem is I can't, I can't even talk to you until I even know what the product is. So it's, that's why I said working with me is a nightmare. You have to send me the product. Then I have to decide if it's even worth talking about, because if I can't get excited about it, dude, I don't, I don't have any acting skills. I'm barely a decent YouTuber, much less an actor. <laughs> okay. So I can't be like, check this out. You, you guys, I told you, you guys read me like a book every time it's like, um, you know, you're like, Oh, you could tell you didn't like that. So, that's the, that's the process. So the process is you just reach out to me, tell me what your, your, your product is. Let me research it. I'll email you back. If it's something I think it's interesting, you got to send it to me. And then we have to discuss how we're going to present it to the audience. And that's like I said, that's why working with me is, is, is difficult because, uh, I give a crap. That's what it is. I'm not saying people who other people don't give a crap. It's just, I told you guys, I'm very, very, uh, very strict about certain things. I was lucky enough to figure out how to make money on the YouTube platform without the companies. They are still, um, last year for 2020 
companies were not even 3% of all my revenue from YouTube. So I don't say that as a brag. I say that as, I mean, what would you, if you were me, would you care about what companies want you to do or not do when they're not even supporting, you know, the channel, the, the biggest supporter of my, the biggest support of my channel comes from the merch and the patrons. That's the biggest, uh, draw of cash coming in to support the channel. So that's why I kind of focus that energy towards what we want to watch and do. So to answer your question is, uh, um, yes, I will. I would love to check out your stuff. Send me stuff about it. I could, you know what I mean? It's great. Um, uh, I would love to opportunity to check out new gear. I like check out new gear. Um, but also keep in mind, you know, we'll have to talk about if it warrants a video or maybe I'll do a shout out on the live show. I mean, obviously I want to help the small builders. The other problem too that happens, and this is important too, is sometimes people like to reach out to you and they don't realize the, the volume of power. Look, I, know, I try to be humble. I think it's a good characteristic and, and, and I think it's a, something everybody should stick to, but I'd be lying if I didn't say this channel sold millions and millions and millions and maybe tens of millions and no exaggeration of dollars worth of gear because you guys are just like me and you have rooms that look just like this and you buy stuff. And so the problem is not that I'm bragging like, ah, if I talk about it, you're going to sell a lot. I've actually had this problem. I had a company, uh, which I, you know, I feel bad about this day. I had a company I did a video for. They did. I didn't think because I didn't know any better. I was too naive. They didn't know. I told you guys about it. And, um, they sold so many products in the first day, they actually quit because they couldn't fulfill orders. It would take them, they told me it was going to take 15 months to fill those orders. They had no, they could make like three a week and we sold like 300 in the first day. <laughs> so that's another thing too. Yeah, it's all about, we got to talk about. So send me an email. Uh, Carl's, it's really simple. When you send me emails, guys, obviously if it's a business email, send it to either McKnight 7 or to Ask Know Your Gear. It really gets filtered by that. Uh, thing. If you're asking me questions and doing stuff, I put that in a folder. So when I have free time, I try to address that stuff when I can. If it's a business thing like this and it's about making content, I'll, I'll take a look at it usually right away and at least get a sense of it to see if we can work together. And um, and like I said, and what that looks like, and, and your point is uh, you basically can't find anyone to review it on YouTube without charging me. Um, well, they got to understand that's how they made their business model. And and I'm, I'm not here to ever say that that's a bad business model. It's, uh, it's, it's how they make money. I, like I said, I was very lucky. I lucked out. That's how I look at it. I was very lucky. And when I say I was lucky, it's simple. Um, I had, uh, the channel took off really quickly at the very beginning. I had 30,000. No, nah, it's not even talking about that. I had a hundred thousand subscribers before I even started knowing companies were even paying YouTubers. I didn't even know that existed. Cause I hadn't really talked to anyone yet to find out that was a, that was, that was a deal even all open to me. I was just excited whenever a company's like, you want to check out our pedal? I'm like, yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, so, um, so, uh, my point to that is, yeah, they're going to charge you. That's just how it works. And, and the sad thing is I'm not going to charge you, but I'm also not going to do the video if I'm not interested or if I think the audience isn't interested. So that's the benefit of those guys. That's what they offer you. They'll get your name out there and product out there because they're, they're just, you know, they're making content. Uh, so back to guitar stuff, Ash says, what's my favorite current guitar that I own? I'm always going to say it's Nathan's guitar. It's out of frame <laughs> right, right now. It's right on the other side of the silver one. Uh, Nathan's guitar is my favorite guitar because I know I will never sell that guitar. So I still love my Strat, <laughs> but yeah, D. Mitchell says I probably bought six to seven thousand dollars in gears and Phil's recommendations. Um, yeah, and and again, and I take that very seriously. So you know, D. Mitchell, why I find that statement that you say that is great is two reasons. Not because you spent six to seven thousand dollars in gear. Um, because I I do too. I you know I mean I we buy gear, and if you don't you know your the amount of money you spend is is representative to how long you've been collecting or how much you make. Some people spend six hundred dollars, some people spend sixty dollars, some people spend sixteen thousand dollars. It's it's it all helps the economy. It's all good stuff, and I hopefully it brings you joy. But what I like, D Mitchell, is that you're here hanging out on a Friday, and that's the whole point of this part of the the the, the YouTube channel is that I do the videos that you watch and hopefully that inspires you to get excited about something and then do something. And then here 
you hanging out and saying something like that to me means that those recommendations were good. See, it's not important to me that you bought $6,000 or $600 in gear. It's important to me that you felt those recommendations were good enough that you're going to hang out and talk some more. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that's just, hey, that's what owning a store for 12 years d- taught me. You know, every customer, you want return customers. You don't survive in this industry without return business. There's no such thing. You can't sell everybody one guitar. You'll go out of business. <laughs> so, um, Andrew says, you will never sell your Halo either. Yeah, the Halo uh, it will never get sold. And I can guarantee that because my name's on it. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there, uh, um, there's, there's, I actually get rid of very few guitars. It just always seems like I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm getting rid of more guitars than you think I am. Mostly some guitars are just getting reviewed. So they just come in and out. They're here and they're gone. Right. Um, that court guitar I just did, that was gorgeous. That G 300 it's, it's already shipped out. It's gone. It was here for the, for the video and then it goes. So Uh, okay. Blood arena. We're going over, but you know what? I want to anyways. Uh, blood arena says, Phil, do you think it's worth, uh, learning how to build a Les Paul instead of buying one? Um, yeah. Yeah. Do I think it's worth it? Yeah. Do I think you ha- you should have to do that or you should do that? No, better yet. Do I think you should do that? No, I don't think you should do that. Um, I think that it's worth it. Skills. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, again, um, perfect example of I repair guitars. I I had no inkling to go, Hey, I'm going to repair guitars for a living. (laughs) You know what I mean? I learned a skill and then I decided I was going to put it in place and try to make money with it. Uh, I love it. So sometimes, no, teaching yourself a new skill is great. Uh, Let me put it this way. I don't regret learning how to fix or repair or do any of that stuff or play guitar. I don't regret any of this stuff. I regret sometimes now not learning other skills and traits, (laughs) maybe how to cook better. That'd be nice. (laughs) Um, (laughs) my, my wife cooks and then I door dash. Uh, so if you guys, you know, so not very proud of that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And then Sean Brooks, I guys, I just like the comments now. Uh, it says, uh, worth, uh, learning a skill. The journey is not the destination. Absolutely. That's the thing. I, 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 you know, that's what I say to the beginning guitar players. They go, you know, how long before I get good? And I go, well, that's a great part. It doesn't matter how long it takes. You, if you're in, if you're doing guitar, right, you're enjoying the learning part. So the practice is, is part of the joy. So the, you know, <laughs> same, same thing. Same thing repair. The repairing is part of the joy. Um, uh, okay. Next one is Sergio. Sergio says, I got a cheap Jackson Dink. Oh, by the way, I got to cut this off. So at some point, so let me refresh this. Cause I, sh- that's what I should have done. That's why we're going long. I've, I've been telling people the last couple of shows were better when I did it. So I'm going to cut everybody off at John Pacino. So any, please don't super chat anything. And I'll try to do a couple super chats and then try to, do some non super chats and see how we, we get Sergio says, I got a cheap Jackson dinky plucked by Sweetwater. I got the idea from you. No regrets. Thanks so much. I, I'm glad again. You know, what's great about that video? Sure. Did it get 140,000 views and whatever? Is that great? Yeah. But you know what that inspired me was what inspires that video. I hope you guys, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm, I'm that's what I want to say. Not, I, I want to say, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I thought to myself, no one is crazy enough. <laughs> I don't say no one. Uh, no one I know is crazy enough to spend two hundred fifty dollars to pluck a guitar that's only worth two hundred bucks. And I thought to myself, but that's the best way to see if it works because plucking a two thousand dollar guitar, I don't know what that tells me, but plucking a two hundred dollar guitar should tell me something. You know, it, the fact that the guitar is good doesn't tell me plucking is good. If the guitar was bad, that would have tell me plucking is full of crap. And that would have been interesting, right? And what's great about that is I never know how this is going to go. But what I want to tell you is the gift that you guys have given me. So hopefully we'll give it back. And that's how this, you build a community. The gift you guys have given me is I bought that Squire that's behind me that I can't point to because the screen's backwards. This one, I bought the Squire for $200 from Sweetwater. I paid $250 to pluck it. And I did it because I was curious, which means I thought you were curious and I thought it'd be a great video, but really I thought, man, there's no way I don't make that back, right? So all I was thinking was, 
even if I, I film it and I edit it and I do all the stuff and, and, and I put it out and even if the video only makes 400 and I think 70, $68, that's all I had to make. I figured if I can make $468 on this video or close to it, actually I wasn't even thinking that I was thinking if the video could, if the, if the, the video could make at least 200, $200, I could always sell the guitar for 200 bucks. Didn't cost me anything. Sure. I worked for free, but that was a fun video to make. And we all learned something and we either learned never do that or it's worth doing. And uh, that's why I loved it. And that video ended up uh, actually working out. So I actually flipped a profit on that. Um, and uh, not a lot because <laughs> I think I talked about this before. I accidentally didn't push the video, the commercial before the video on accident for the first like 50, 60,000 views. That was a very bonehead thing do happen sometimes. But, um, the cool thing is uh, the video did make some money, which is good. And the guitar is, uh, that's what I was telling you guys earlier. This guitar is going to be in another video soon that you'll love. It's a sharp max video, but it's also a recap on how the plec held up. And then I'm going to sell the guitar off and then recoup the money. So that's where I figure we'll have some, some, you know, our reciprocal arrangement will come together. You know what I mean? We'll make some good content. We'll have some fun. Um, you know, obviously I'm in business, so I want to make some money. I want to make some money. I want to have some fun and I want this, you guys to get value. I think that's, that's the goal. I think that's so do Max says, Phil, I just acquired a GNL ASAT S hat. <laughs> I'm always going to say that I have an S hat too. I love it. Uh, says, and something seems to be wrong with the nut. The high E is hanging off the edge on the fretboard. Should I fix it myself or take it and have it done professionally? You should watch my video. I will link it, uh, called how, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, you know, what's funny is I titled it and the title, I guess was not very good. And then, uh, guitar world shared the, the video and they titled it better. It's how to set your string alignment. So, um, do Mac, I have a video on that shows you in, in two minutes, how you can fix that issue on that guitar. So what you could do for me is, uh, just go into my, um, my videos and type in like Phil McKnight, how to set string alignment. It'll come up. That'll be enough to, to, to go on, um, YouTube, watch that video and see if it works for you. And then just uh, let me know. <laughs> you can email me just when you email me guys, if you want to tell me stuff like that, if you ever want to get my attention on email, make it one sentence. I'll tell you a little secret about emails too. One sentence. And if you, that's not enough. If you need a little bit more, take a space and then make another sentence. When I see three paragraphs of stuff, the first thing I do is I put that email in a folder so that I have time to read that. Because if it takes me five minutes to read your email and I know it's going to take five minutes to respond, see it's 10 minute email. And I think, well, can I just address like five, two minute emails? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm trying to economize my time. So if you really need to get a hold of me, if you really want to talk to me, it's not that hard. People talk to me all day. I, I'm chatting back and forth on emails all day. It's, you got to get it to the point. You got to keep it sweet and short. And as much as, and sometimes I enjoy reading your guys' long emails, you know, you know, your, your, your history, your story and stuff. But if you really re, I'm not talking about why you should or should not email me. What I'm telling you is if it's important to you that you ever hear back from me, that's how you get back to me. It get me to get back to you. You give me a, a something so short that I can respond with, heck, if you can get me, if you can get me something where I can just thumbs up you back with an emoji, at least, you know, I saw it and I'm communicating with you. And then that's usually a fast way. So, uh, vanilla, vanilla ninja, vanilla, vanilla ninja, ninja, ninja. That's gotta be vanilla ninja. Did a super chat for no reason. Thank you. I appreciate that. Vanilla Ninja. <laughs> Vanilla Ninja. I like that. Uh, and my axe. All right. And my axe. Says, Phil, I record with the THR10. That's the Yamaha THR10 amp. I post jam tracks on YouTube. Is it worth upgrading to a tube amp given YouTube audio compression? No. 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 Um, as much content as I've made on YouTube, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm trying to actually try to have you guys hear what I think the thing really sounds like, I wouldn't use anything analog to do YouTube in any way. Um, I like analog. I like analog amps, tube amps. You know, I like the tangible stuff, miking up stuff, but realistically, anytime I'm not reviewing anything for the sound, I am plugged into some kind of digital thing, whether it's my Helix or my interface, my computer with plugins or any of that stuff. I'm always on that stuff as much as I can. And every time I use that stuff, you guys go, man, your tone's really good, which is why half the YouTube channels, no, 
that's wrong. Not half the YouTube channels. That's why half the time on YouTube, you hear stuff and you go, man, that tone was killer. Half the tone was killer was because it was some kind of digital packed thing. There's a, you know, yeah. So no, uh, if you're doing good, the THR 10 is great. It's a great product. I really want one. <laughs> I have my Spark. I love it. So there's no reason for me to get a THR 10 now. I, if it wasn't for the Spark, I probably would end up finally buying the THR 10 and doing a video, but I just can't justify one now with the Spark. I like my Spark and I'm happy. Uh, Mike Chin 517 says ASL question mark. I have no idea what that means. Why do I don't know what that means? ASL. Okay. Uh, Kevin Lee says, Hey Phil, what are some of your favorite Vox style amps you've tried? I'm a diehard, uh, deluxe reverb type of player, but I am looking to broaden my horizons. Sure. My favorite Vox style amps are by far Morgan and Dr. Z. I have a Dr. Z Maz 18, which is kind of loosely based on that kind of style of amp. I love my Maz. It's really great. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I'm gonna, I guess, cause it's late in the show. And if you're watching now, you're just two hour, half hours in, you're cool. <laughs> that's it, you're cool so um i have a video coming on the black star 10 studio 10 and i liked it almost as much as my as maz 18 but my buddy eric and ralph thought it sounded better than the maz 18 that says a lot because the maz is like a 2g amp two grand and the black star was like a 500 600 dollar amp new so you know, there you go. Uh, that was great. And that Studio 10, I have the Studio 10 that's like the voice, like the Vox. I love that amp. Uh, like I said, I'm ruining it because no one's going to watch the review now. Like, oh, he's going to tell us how much he loves it. But I'm going to tell you why I love it. I love that amp. And that's a perfect example. That amp, I think I told you guys this. Blackstar asked me to review their new practice amp, which I did. But the condition of that review was I will review the product they want, but they got to send me a product I was really interested in reviewing. And that was the Studio 10. I want to share that with amp with you. I think that's one of the best 112 little combos out there. So it's something I really love. So uh, that, uh, obviously, Morgan, Dr. Z, those are great uh, Vox style amps. Uh, but I think if you're really looking for a cool little Vox style amp, you can check out that Black Star as well. Uh, Edgardo? Edgardo says, I bought a modern V PRS 22 fret. Modern? F okay. PRS 22 fret with tremolo bridge, lowered action to 6.0 and fret buzz. Tried everything, even radius and strings. Uh, straightened and the neck does not does this guitar like high action okay um again it's kind of tricky because it's a it's a tricky question because it's i don't have all the facts but are the factors but um a prs 22 fret guitar with tremolo bridge should get you a pretty decent action no problem my guess is if you're setting the action low and you're getting fret buzz, what you're going to have to really focus on is where the fret buzz is happening, whether it's the open string, whether it's a fretted string, and um, and uh, there's no reason that guitar shouldn't play right. So is it possible that it has issues? Of course. Any guitar cannot perform the way we want it. But reasonably speaking, that guitar should be playing fantastic. So the reason I tell you that is for one reason, one reason only. Usually a guitar like that, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the best answer I can give you. When somebody gives me a really inexpensive guitar and I'm working on it and everything is just not coming together and the guitar is just buzzing and no matter what I do and I'm like, check the frets and the frets are good and I'm just going chasing this tail and I can't get it right and I keep going. At some point, you got to call it. You're like, you know, just like a doctor, like, hey, the patient, what, you know, here's the here's time of death. Okay. At some point, you got to call this. Okay. I will tell you this as a, as a, just a normal thing besides when my ego is in play, sometimes you're just like, I'm you know, you just don't want to call the customer and tell them like you couldn't do it because you're, hey, we all have egos. So like, I don't want to tell, I don't want to admit defeat. So uh, sometimes I'll just go for that, for the ego. But when my brain is in charge, <laughs> when my brain's in charge, a guitar like that, a PRS guitar, a high-end guitar, a guitar that's built really well, when I'm having issues like that, I will just keep going at it. It'll eventually work itself out. You'll find the problem. It's all about figuring out where the problem's happening. If you're having low action and you're getting buzz, it's just because there's a problem somewhere, whether it is the alignment of this neck of the frets are not right. Something is wrong. Something you'll get there. You'll get there. Also too, you also have to sometimes stop. Okay. Sometimes part of the problem is, is you get hyper-focused on buzz. Buzz is one of those things that people hear. And then no matter what you do, you're just hearing it. It's still buzzing. 
But here is where you have to take a step back and just pay attention, okay? If I was adjusting a guitar, if I was doing a setup on a guitar, any guitar, doesn't matter what brand or what price point, and it's buzzing, and I work on it, it's still buzzing. I don't, I don't go, oh, it's still buzzing. I go, okay, at this point, since I can't solve the problem that easy, is it buzzing less? Is there less? Once I know there's less, then I can keep going less. And even if I get to a point where I can't do any better, at least I understand the improvement. What was the improvement? I understand the goal, no buzz. <laughs> but sometimes it's about a lot of buzz to minimum buzz, you know what I mean? So there you go. Um, because sometimes the reason my thought process is like that is a lot of times if I have a customer that has a low tolerance for buzz and they, and sometimes you do, you just like none, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, Hey, I like really low action, nine gauge strings and no buzz. Great. This will be a fun setup anyways. Uh, <laughs> but it's your customer. That's what the majority of us want is something like that. Um, what I try to do is obviously be, comply with their request to give them what they want. But if I also want to be the guy who, if I can't do it, I want to explain, this is where I got you. This is the best it's going to be. And if it can't be enough to where they're happy with it, at least it should be good enough for them to sell it off if that's going to be an issue later. Because some people some people have different tolerances for that. Jordan says, thoughts on the Surek bases. Okay. Uh, with brands like Fender raising their prices so high, it feels like boutique builders have a lot more uh, validity in the market. Um, yes, obviously, obviously two things as Fender prices, as it's always been this way, as the main brands get more expensive, the lesser known brands opportunity is of course the price it's and, 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 and keep in mind, this is why I always like when I do a video, when all, all these YouTube channels do a video about a new brand, a lot of people don't understand Anyone who's been in this market for any period of time knows that sometimes the the sweetest deal is the new brand because they're just going for market share. Anyone who just wants any new business, a lot of times the new business just wants market share. It makes sense to sell product at almost no profit to get customers to start the brand, you know, start the, the ball rolling on the brand. So yeah, of course, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, you buy uh, name brands anymore for value of dollar. I think you buy them for ease of mind to know that they're, a, you know, it's a better resale value, average, better quality because they have a brand name to protect. I don't mind small brands unless of course I get the vibe that they're fly by night. They're just going to make a bunch of junk and then, you know, disappear. But that's not really the most, the, the case. Cletus says, I have a Gibson Les Paul standard. Okay. Really nice Tom Anderson. I love Tom Anderson's, but I keep coming back to my Epiphone Les Paul I've had for years. Do I have any guitar? Do you have any guitars you prefer others than you shouldn't? Absolutely. So in the room behind me, um, I can honestly tell you that one of my favorite guitars in this room is uh, that Dane Electro that I'm pointing at right there. That Dane Electro uh, 59. That is not a Dane Electro, so you know that... Dan Electro gave me, Steve and Dan Electro uh, sent me some Dan Electros and of course I got to keep them and that was very nice. But that I did that because I liked the brand. Talked about the guitars because I like those guitars. That particular guitar, oh, hit my guitar. <laughs> that particular guitar I bought uh, uh, used because I wanted the color. It was black, metallic, and I liked it. Um, love that guitar. I'm into that guitar for 250 bucks. <laughs> this is only interesting because this subject literally came up yesterday when my wife came in here to ask me a question. And she was, when I was looking at paperwork, whatever she had me doing, she was looking around the room and she was trying, she asked me, uh, which is the more expensive and what are the less expensive guitars in here? And we were talking exactly what you're talking about. And the prices did not equate to anything. There was no logic to what the guitars cost versus what I, how much I like them um, at all, at all. I will tell you this, my two favorite guitars in the whole world, besides the one that Nathan built me, because that's not fair, because one, he built it, and two, he didn't, you know, I got it for free because he gave it to me. Um, uh, but my two favorite guitars, one cost me $700 and the other one cost me 1000 Those are my two favorite guitars, no question about it. Those are the ones I play. So... That's a lot of money. I'm not saying that's not a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But in retrospect to some of the guitars behind me, they're significantly less than some of those. Uh, John says, hey, Phil, thanks for the Hangout Stu Mac tool packs. 
Stu Mac Toolbox. I, are you asking about, we talked about, remember Stu Mac reached out. I think I talked to you guys. That's why I said sometimes I don't want to talk about this stuff because I talk about stuff and then it doesn't happen. It seems like it's the curse of the podcast. Hey, guess what, everybody? This company's doing this or I got to do this and then it doesn't happen. Stu Mac had asked about me putting together uh, like a, a curator, a curated a tool pack. Um that didn't happen. I, it was no for no particular reason that I can tell. Like, I don't think it was like them disinterested in it. I just, there was an idea they presented to me. I love the idea about curating a tool pack that you could buy. Um, and, uh, didn't work out, but here's what did work out. I still want to do the, uh, a tool pack and uh, I don't need them to do a tool pack. <laughs> um, uh, my logic was I would be interested to do a tool pack and then you guys could click and buy it and then maybe save yourself 10, 15%. That'd be kind of cool. Um, I don't know if they're interested in doing that. So uh, make it easier. I'll just put a tool pack together of Stool Mac tools and uh, do a video. And it just so happens to work out that I actually have to do it anyways, but for another reason. So not for a company reason, but for a friend. So, um, that's basically what I'm gonna do. I have a friend who, who, who wanted exactly what you're asking. He's like, would you put together me a tool pack? So I basically said, I have a great idea. Why don't, um, why don't you let me buy everything? He reimbursed me. Uh, let me buy all this stuff. Instead of telling him what tools I think you should get, why don't you let me go on their website, buy everything and put it together in like a little toolbox and then I'll film the whole thing and then I'll ship it to you. And, uh, you know, and, uh, that way there's a video on that. So that will be happening. Uh, Matt, is this the, we're almost at the end. Hold on a second. This is gonna be the first three hour show ever. Uh, okay. We're at Matt. Matt says fill around for around five to $700. Okay. That's a range. What would you recommend? Fender play? I think he means five to 500 to $700. So, uh, what would you recommend? A Fender Player Series, Sire, LC Sterling, Nick Johnson, or some other style of uh, Fender guitars? Um, you know, the the sad thing is, uh, I have never played a Sire guitar, but I have one downstairs. I bought one for the channel. I have a Sire L7. It's here. I have not done the unboxing video. So what I've been doing on the videos, the way you guys see them, you guys, uh, if you're at one, follow my Instagram, you saw today, the Reverend unboxing. What I'm doing with all these videos, all these guitars I'm buying for the channel is I'm filming all the unboxings. I'm feeling, uh, instead of filming start to finish, like I used to, like I got a guitar and then I walk you through the, you know, here it is. It's unboxing, inspection, playing, and then summation. I'm actually doing rows of guitars because I'm already set up for camera work. So I can just go unbox, 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 unbox. And then the next day I do, you know, check, you know, see what I'm saying? So it's like an assembly line of making videos and uh, it's working. But because of that, I haven't done the sire yet because it's not in that, not in this group, um, but it's in the next group. So to answer your question, I haven't tried that one. So based on the stuff I see, I love Sterling stuff. But the good news for you is I really kind of would like not to answer the question. I know it sounds horrible it, because I would rather uh, tell you that I think all the brands except for Sire I've tried and I've liked. So I can't tell you anything about Sire. I've liked the Player Series. I like the Sterling and I like the Schecter Nick Johnson. So I think if you go with any one of those, I think you'd be happy. So it's just your your, your taste. Uh, Sire, I'll love to tell you once I try this one. But all those brands I'm doing videos of right now to some degree. So that'll be good. So, okay. Tampa blues says a blues amp sub $1,200 for home use. Well, that's a lot of them. I mean, a blues amp, you're going to look at Fender Supro. I like the Supro stuff a lot. I like Fender. <coughs> I mean, PV, but it's even less than that. At $1,200, you can get whatever you want <laughs> for a blues amp. Uh, you know, you say for home use. So here's what I would, here's what I'll suggest to you. Instead of suggesting amp, let me tell you what I think you should stay away from. The, some of the most traditional, uh, blues amps uh, out there, like the tweeds and stuff, uh, they need to be cranked. So to me, a uh, blues amp for home use, you want to go for something that literally does that tone at a more reasonable uh, volume. So I like, again, that black star studio 10. It's called Studio 10 because it's 10 watts. It's a 12 inch speaker. I like my Princeton. I like my Deluxe uh, 65. In fact, these, you know, this, I'm recommending all the stuff I have because <laughs> that's what I like. Um, for blues, obviously a Vox AC15 would be fun for blues. It's a great amp. 
the 1200 bucks you i mean there's nothing really besides boutique stuff and a couple of amps for home use that's out of your range you can go, go with whatever you like i would definitely if you can get a chance try some supro stuff though they definitely have a nice flavor and in, into them i've done some reviews and they're really good saturn was a great amp i mean a lot of them Constance says, speaking of Alex from Children of Bodom, how do you feel about guitarists who leave the chorus pedal always on? You know, um, uh, Eddie Van Halen did that. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's funny because when you think, of, you know, Eddie Van Halen and chorus pedals, you know, he did it sparingly. But um, Larry DiMarzio, DiMarzio, everybody was like, you're saying it wrong. He doesn't seem to mind. So it's just probably my, if there's an accent, I think I have one. It's DiMarzio, DiMarzio. Um, Larry was telling me that when they were developing the, uh, pickup for the music band, the, one of the things they had to deal with the fact that he was running a lot of gain in chorus in his tone, they had to find a pickup that helped articulate through that stuff. Um, so interesting story. So when he was telling me that, I thought that was really cool. And so what do I think about it always being on? Oh, Zach Wild. When I think of a chorus pedal and having a good tone, it's Zach Wild. I think it's great. Um, Chorus pedal is one of those things I don't use very often. I don't know why. I love it. I love the way it's... Every time I hear a chorus pedal... Chorus pedal is one of those things where I hear players play it. I go, that's amazing. I need that. And then I plug it in and I try it and I go, I don't know. <laughs> and then I don't do it. But I but I love it. So what do I think of them always leaving it on? I think if it works for your sound, you should do it. It's a really good... It's really a tone. Just for me, it doesn't work. I try to, you know, try to not run as many effects as possible for my sound. Um... John, the last one says, John, hey Phil, which would you pick? Classic vibe or GNL tribute versus Harley Bitten Fusion? Cheers. Uh, I've I've tried all those. Uh, here's what I feel like. The classic vibe is a great guitar. Almost every single one of them I played has been fantastic. The GNL tributes are good. They come from Cortec. Um, I've played a few bad ones. I played a lot of good ones. So in that saying, I can't say that I like the classic better than the GNL, but I can say that I feel more confident recommending the classic is a consistency. The Harley Benton Fusion is a great guitar. I reviewed that guitar. A lot of people gave me grief on that video. Like, Hey, you didn't like it. It's not that I didn't like it. Harley Benton to me, once you hit 400 bucks, I, I got to tell you the same thing. I'm going to tell everybody just like this. Once you're in the Harley Benton Fusion, once you're talking about $400, it's a great guitar. But don't forget, $300, when we were talking about earlier in the show, when we first started, $300, bucks. you are open up a world of great used guitars too. Don't, don't worry about those three guitars uh, in the price point. Don't forget those used guitars. Don't forget that there's great other guitars out there too. So those are three great guitars. I will tell you this. Me, if I was going to pick them in the order, I'd pick the Squire, then the GNL, and then the Harley Benton Fusion. And, and that again, hopefully that weighs with you a little bit because I like the guys at GNL. I know them have a good relationship with them. So I should, I want to promote them first, but personally from experiences, as much as I like their guitars and them, I like the classic vibe a little bit more. Harley Benton. It's good stuff. I like Harley Benton, but you know, it doesn't excite me as much as everyone else gets excited about Harley Benton. I like Harley Benton just fine. I've did reviews. I got nothing bad to say about the guitars. They're good. I think a lot of players uh, like them. I think the quality I've played is good, but there you go. All right. <laughs> we got to call it. We're <laughs> It's uh, basically three hour show. I appreciate you guys so much. I literally finished off the water. Hmm. Almost. So the voice held out pretty good. Um, and, uh, I want to thank everybody for hanging out this long. This was fun. I want to <laughs> thank everybody for all the great questions. Um, if I missed anything, we'll get back to it. Uh, we'll get to it next week. Very cool. Something cool to uh, talk about next week too. I think you'll be excited. Look forward. If you guys didn't enjoy the LTD video this week, uh, a week, uh, please check it out. Uh, I really like that video. And also the sharp my axe on that video, I think will be exciting because I don't think everybody's going to see coming what we're doing with it or what I did with it. Um, and, uh, and then on that note, I'm going to like, since I did so many super chats in a row, I want to do one last non super chat. And that's the Panda and says, Panda says, what about getting an attenuator for amps? I have an attenuator, uh, for amps and they work great. I never love, and I think you keep hearing this. If there's a consistency in the internet, it's that players use attenuators. It's a must have device, especially for at home recording at home playing, I highly recommend you have one. I literally love my Rivera Rock Crusher, but of course there's tons of good choices out there. I can't go wrong with most of them. However, 
every time you plug in the amp, it does what you need it to do and you never seem to love it. And I feel that way. I have a Dr. Z uh, attenuator too, by the way. And same thing. I, I like them. I use them. I They're necessary evil, but I don't ever go, wow, they're amazing. So yeah, can you use them? Absolutely. Do you use them? Absolutely. They always seem to darken the amp and they never seem to get the amp. They never get it right. Like, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you use the aux. I don't care which one you want or use. They're good, but they never seem to do exactly the same. So you have to accept that. And I've accepted it too. So uh, you, you get them and it works. All right. On that note, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. If you liked the video, hit the like button. Uh, if you want to see this again, other videos like this, hit the subscribe button. And uh, until next week, thank you so much for your time and uh, know your gear.